Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Live Ultralight podcast powered by Outdoor Vitals. Today, we are going to be breaking down a recent hike that Brigham and I did where we went down to the Grand Canyon and did rim to rim to rim. So that was the south rim, starting on the south rim because the north rim is still closed for access. So we hike from the south all the way to the north rim, turn around and come back. Um, We did that with a big group of guys and um, it's just a really enjoyable time in the canyon. So that's the plan today. So Brigham, how you doing? Doing well. As per the usual. It's very, actually spring. It's, today. It, yeah. It's finally warming up, which I'm I'm not complaining about at all. Um yeah, so let's let's uh let's just talk about this story. It was it was a heck of a day. We have I guess historically we did this same route or close to the same route two years ago when we fast packed it. Um, we learned a lot. It was really good. And it was really fun to come back and revisit this hike in a different, you know, on a different style of trip. So on that one, we, we covered 38 miles. We did rim, South rim to North rim back to the bottom, which is at Phantom Ranch. And we slept. It was a 38 mile first day. And then followed by about a 10 mile second day to hike out of the Canyon on Bright Angel, uh, Bright Angel trail. So Bright Angel trail was closed this time. So we just went down South Kaibab up North Kaibab and then back up South Kaibab. Um, so a little bit different, but we have done it. Brigham, you've been in the canyon a handful of times, specifically more on the south side, and you have done rim to rim. In fact, you went a month ago and did rim to rim to rim um, before this effort. Um, so we've, yeah, we've been there a few times. And, the, and if you get nothing else out of this podcast, it's it's probably that we actually really enjoy this trail and we'll probably go back again. Because yeah. it is, it's just an epic, iconic trail, I feel like. Yeah, it's definitely... It's funny because I I feel that way at the end of every single time. It's just like yeah, this is a, this is one I want to just keep doing. It's yeah. kind of a good tradition. Yeah, there's something about it that's uh, definitely worth doing over and over and and going back to it and and it's different. It's different to go down into the canyon versus stay on the rim. Um, you know, like people drive there all the time. I mean, just when I was leaving, the line to get into the national park was was huge. Oh, right. Yeah, um, so there's, I mean, it, it sees tons of people, but most people stay right on top or maybe hike like a half mile down or something from the top. But that that particular national park, I mean, there's so many different views and vantage points as you get all the way down into the canyon. So just a phenomenal Phenomenal trip. So this particular trip was a little bit different. We were we were meeting up with some buddies um, that would that do a an annual hike. So this they basically twenty guys they'll get together do an annual hike and they, they usually try to try to get to hundred miles on their hikes as well. Um, but this so the, so the plan with this one was actually to do an R three right rim to rim to rim and then turn around and do it again with maybe couple hours of sleep or something like that and just try to blitz it. And um, it's definitely one, it was, it was interesting because these guys have all hiked before together and this was Minor Brigham's first time meeting them and, uh, or at least meeting most of them um, and and hiking with them. And um, it was, it was, uh, it was fun, fun to get to know these guys. Yeah, it was. Um, and they're pretty like very mission focused. Like they were very set on this plan of doing an R6 and um, just, just, a lot of athletes, a lot of guys that spend a lot of time in the mountains, and um, they definitely feed off of each other a little bit. There's definitely some, um, you know, energy and, and kind of pushing each other. I felt like that was that was happening, and so, um, yeah. So we got invited on this. We show up. I have an ultra marathon this like in two days, and this was just last weekend. So I had previously decided to not do the R6 and just do the R3. But everyone else was still planning on doing the R6. Um, and so we we got there um, Thursday night, met yep. met everyone. And the plan was to sleep at a campground there that was about three miles from the South, Pi- South Kaibab Trailhead. And so we'd sleep there, get up, and be hiking by about 4 o'clock, 4 a.m. Yeah. From, the, from the camp. So a lot of people when they do the the rim to rim to rim they'll they'll take the shuttle to the trailhead but with the mileage we were trying it, it was going to work out well to start the hike from camp to get six extra miles to try to hit that that hundred so and I don't know that the shuttle runs at four a.m. <laughs> yeah I don't think it does either <laughs> so I think we were up up before it and then we were honestly anticipating probably getting there after the shuttle was was closed down as well right. so. 
Um, yeah, anything else I missed on just kind of setting the stage of, of what this was? Um, obviously, we can we can talk about the trail details as well. Yeah, I mean, the you mentioned that this group, they do it every year. They try to hit, you know, somewhere around 100 miles. But I think the other goal that this group tries to accomplish is is to do a hike that's like really, really hard. Like that's that's definitely type two and eventually type three fun to where you're pretty completely beaten down by the end, you know? And so mm-hmm. they uh, they actually had talked to us about the route before, you know, wondering like, hey, we're thinking about doing this for our annual hike. We know you guys have done it. Like, what are your thoughts? And we basically kind of just told them like, well, one is like, it's a good long day and that's, you know, it's a 48 to 50 mile hike, but knowing what you guys are kind of looking for probably isn't going to be like that terrible challenge that you're looking for. So you probably would want to do it twice. So that was kind of like what they were looking for is to, you know, a a pretty good amount of pain, I would say. Yeah. They kind of seek that out. Um, this is something that they all do. It seems like to keep themselves in shape. Um, you know, so like, cause when you set a big goal like this, obviously, you know, you have this like brutal hike coming up every spring. Um, it definitely pushes you, right. Gets you off the couch, gets you out logging miles or in the gym or whatever it is. And so they do it a little bit to, to keep themselves in shape in the off season per se. And then also, um, yeah, to, to, to just kind of push their limits, find their limits, do it collectively. Historically, some of the hikes they've done have been way more, you know, even like route finding and stuff. So they were off trail stuff. Yeah. The times off trail stuff in like Alaska and Montana or Idaho. And and so this one, they're like, oh, there's a trail. Like it's, you know, it's going to be that much easier, which I mean, when you don't have to wayfind, that's a big mental ask. And and it gets tough when you're going through the night. And because usually they're, they were, you know, sleeping very little on, on some of these. And so there was an aspect of that. That being said, there's the Grand Canyon is is brutal. Um, it's it's the Grand Canyon for a reason, right? And and the biggest factor, the two biggest factors, I would say that people often overlook in the Grand Canyon um, is is one, it is graded trail. Like I mean, I mean, like it's it's trail, right? It's not you're on, off trail, but the trail itself at times is pretty rough. You know, Bright Angel Trail, pretty dang good, very well graded. But you go to like South Kaibab. You've got um, these logs that go across the trail. Then you have mules that come in up and down the trail, and they dig these big holes in the trail. It's very, very steep. Um, and so you've got this mixture of, like, it is trail, but, like, you're constantly stretching your foot to hit this log, jumping onto this rock, stepping in a hole, lifting your foot up and over. Like, even on the downhill, you're, like, lifting your foot up and over stuff. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a weird thing to experience because you're, you're going down steep stuff, but you're still lifting your foot up. Yeah. Like, everyone that I, – I think everybody that I was within ear distance to hear talk throughout any time during the hike, like, that was one thing that – kept coming up was like there it's not even possible to get in a, a cadence or a rhythm with your yep. with your feet so it's like it's, impo- it's a trail it but it's like the most um inhospitable trail <laughs> or like just the most uneven trail that's it's technically a trail but i mean y- you might as well be off trail in terms of like the the footwork and the the leg work that it, that it creates like that's it's almost like walking just through miles of deadfall you know if, yeah. if like every log was about a foot off the ground mm. and you're but they're all randomly spaced you know and you just you're you're just stepping over and that's a that's a pretty good comparison because I was just about to say like at times I would have rather just been off trail <laughs> like cuz there are definitely areas of mountains or whatever that it would just have been easier to not be on a trail at all yeah. versus the trail that is there right so yeah like like very short deadfall you know like not like like not step like not, not like hurdling deadfall but you know if you're talking about 12 to 16 inch deadfall mm-hmm. like on on the trail that's kind of what it feels like at times right and then you're going down, so it it lures you into this, and you're going down a lot of steep trail, so it lures you into this feeling of going faster or like, hey, like if I just start jumping from here to here to here, it's easier, and it is easier, but it like like cardio wise or maybe even mentally wise, but the thing is, we kind of did that the first time we did it with fast packing, so we also had more weight on our backs, and by the time we got to the bottom, our legs were 
were not set up to do much more hiking that day. And we had a whole lot of hiking. Like it, it really just blew through our legs, blew through our quads, um, and, and calves, especially mm-hmm. you're just pointing your toe and landing on your toe. And so it's a brutal trail. So that's the first thing I would say about the Grand Canyon and even going up the North side, you know, the trail that they've built is, is amazing. Um, but it has massive steps at times and, and just the, the same cadence issue essentially. So the other part of the Grand Canyon, I think people often overlook is like on a day, um, there's a lot of people that'll climb, let's say 4,000 feet of vertical or 5,000 feet of vertical. I mean, when I was out on the Appalachian trail, um, you know, you're just climbing up and down hills the whole day. Right. And, and you get a lot of vertical by the end of the day, maybe even up to 4,000 feet in the day, but it's all like a 500 foot climb, a 500 foot descend, 500 foot climb, 500 foot descend. What is extremely difficult about the Grand Canyon is it becomes exponentially more of an ask on the body to go 5,000 feet of straight climbing versus like 1,000 feet up, 1,000 feet down, or 2,000 feet up, 2,000 feet down. So it, 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 I don't know if we have really any other places, nowhere I've ever been, where you just go 5,000 feet straight up in one push. I've had right. like 3,500 foot climbs. Maybe we've hit four at times. Um, those are rare, super rare, but the Grand Canyon, it's a full 5,000 feet on both ends of it of climbing. And so when you do an R3, you do, you drop down the 5,000 feet and then you get all the way over to the other end, you climb the 5,000 feet in one shot, turn around, come down, and then you're doing that again. So on the day, on the whole day, you're getting about 12,500 feet of climbing and descending, but it's exponentially more hard to have chunks of 5,000 versus a couple thousand and back down. Um, it just, it, it lends you to like, oh, you do the first one or 2000 feet really well. And then all of a sudden you hit a calorie wall or you start cramping up because you weren't hydrating well enough, or it's very hard to like keep pace the whole climb up if you're not very aware of that. So, so those are the two things I I just wanted to to point out, um, about the trail. And then obviously Brigham, you you noted this, but on the day we were looking like we were going to do about 49 to 50 miles to do the R3 the first time. Right. So um, yeah, other than that, we were expecting some interesting weather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We timed it perfect. <laughs> Always. Um, basically it was looking like it was going to rain on us at about nine or 10 AM. And then, and then that we were going to have some higher winds now, like looking, I was looking at like the weather on the South Rim, Phantom Ranch, North Rim. And I didn't like look into as much of a detailed description, but I was just seeing like 20 to 23 mile an hour winds not necessarily thinking about more of like gusting winds, right. but we'll get, we'll get to that. So we knew we were going to have wind. We knew we would potentially have a little bit of water and it was, it was pretty cold. Um, starting off the trail, it was 40 degrees. Um, you know, according to the weather app at the campsite, which wasn't bad. Yeah, it was bad. Um, but then it was supposed to dip. The temperature was supposed to dip throughout the day being like the high in Phantom Ranch. If we were, if we had been at Phantom Ranch in the very middle of the day, I think we would have touched about 60 degrees. But the high on the north rim, um, according to the weather app, was 34 degrees. So you get a massive disparity of, of, of temperatures doing it, especially in the spring, right? North rim still has snow on it. That's why it's not open. Um, but you're starting on the south rim. Phantom Ranch is so much lower than you that it's, it's quite hot. So it's just this big, big temperature swings. And we, we had timed it where we were going to get um, some additional weather to mix into just the temperature swings. Yeah, it's it, – yeah. It was just, it's just amazing because if you look at like the weather f- forecast readout, you know, like the four days leading up to when we were going to start our hike were just beautiful, you know, probably like 60s at the rim, you know, getting down to the upper 70s down at the bottom. And then the two days, maybe two and a half, three days that we were going to be there, it was 20 degrees colder. It was like just this little, ch- and then immediately like the day after we left, it was back up into the 60s and 70s and sunny and no wind, no snow. Yeah. It was unique. Yeah. yeah great timing. Um, <laughs> so there's a few things that we'll touch on at the end of the podcast too before we dive into the story. Some of the things that we're carrying um, will be will be some of the this, those. Um, and there's a few other like takeaways that, that we'll share about just like maybe like some advice if you ever were looking to do this hike. But right now let's just jump into the story so we we get there basically we're meeting 
you know, about 19, 20 new faces and trying to get to know people and I'll talking a little bit about the hike and then we go to bed fairly early, nine before 10. Um, and then we, you know, alarm goes off at about 3.30 a.m. And we start gathering up the, the group of, of guys and we ended up breaking camp at about 4.15. So we take off out of camp um, and we were hoofing it. We were hiking, we weren't running or anything like that. And most of the guys weren't planning on doing any running at least to my knowledge, uh, most of them had like bigger packs on and stuff with just nothing in them, but like their typical hiking backpacks. Um, this is a big group of sportsmen. So like hunting backpacks and stuff as well. And, um, but we, we, we launched out of camp doing 16 minute miles hiking. <laughs> I mean, pretty we, good pace. we were cruising at nearly a four mile an hour pace, just going along the flat, flatter top to the South Kaibab trail. And, um, got to the South Kaibab trail and it, we had some wind for sure. Like as soon as you get up on there and I think it's, I think the Grand Canyon, I've only been there like twice. Right. But it's always windy. Um, so we're getting some wind. We start dropping into the Canyon and I don't know, we probably made it a mile, two miles down the trail before you could kind of turn your headlamp off. Um, it had gotten light enough, fast enough that you could start to see, start pull out the camera a little bit and get some of those beautiful views of that, that South Kaibab offers. I will say that is the one big benefit I would say of South Kaibab trail is yeah. even over bright angel is you're kind of going down more of a ridge line, And so you're getting expansive views off of two different sides. You can really see a lot, a lot of the Canyon. And, and if you're there, you know, for something like sunrise or sunset, um, it's, it's a, a phenomenal, phenomenal sight. Beautiful, beautiful view. Um, but yeah, kind of like you mentioned, the group started to thin out and, and you know, people are kind of doing, you know, handling the trail itself at different levels, you know, with the drops and the awkwardness of the trail and so on and so forth. Um, and so the, the group started to thin out, I mean, almost immediately. And that was kind of the plan from the beginning is we wouldn't be staying as a group of 20. It's just too big, too big of a group. Everyone's on too, too much of a different pace different fitness levels, different desires of how quick they want to do things or not want to do things, different paces. Um, so it started to thin out a little bit, but, um, me and Brigham, we were trying to be, I don't know. I was, Brigham was planning on doing the R6, right? Um, but either way, we had told a lot of people, we don't advise running down South Kaibab. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, we got about halfway down, and pretty soon some people start running it. Um, I didn't even see the. You running. didn't see him? No, I didn't oh, see yeah. the running. Yep, yep. Dan and and those guys. I mean, there's probably seven plus guys mm. that started to break into some slight running on the downhill, and um, I kind of wanted to just be a little bit more up at the front, but I very consciously was like, nope, I've done that. I will not do it again. So I just power hiked down. Um, and, um, it went, it went smooth, really pretty got to the bottom. And I can honestly say I felt a million times better than the first time I had done this trail. Uh, obviously had a little bit less weight in my backpack with not having to carry like a tent and a sleeping bag and, um, a pad and a little more food. But, um, but yeah, the lack of running, I immediately was like such a wise choice. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, how did the hike down from the top go for you? Um, uh, it was good. Yeah, it was I, I I don't mind the kind of the cold start, mm -hmm. and because uh, it's nice to just, uh, just not be hot, you know, hiking in in the heat. So, um, but yeah, I was definitely, um, you know, and and I've you mentioned been there several times, so kind of have the experience to know like I'm not gonna try to not gonna try to keep up a pace and 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 go quickly down down the canyon um so i yeah I, it was good um i i had to stop and use the one of the the first bathroom which is only like two miles down and um uh, it makes sense now you're saying guys were running and yeah they um, broke out while because you were in there. people were really trying to go fast and uh i wasn't trying to go fast but I, yeah i stopped to use the bathroom but and by the time i got out like i couldn't even see anybody so, um, I eventually, I mean, it took probably a couple miles before, you know, the next people in front of me stopped to either get water or use a bathroom. And so, 
you know, eventually kind of caught up with people. But, um, yeah, by the time got to the bottom, um, yeah, I was, I was feeling good. And, again, I think it's – I had the advantage of having done it several times and kind of knowing what I need to do to, to get to the bottom feeling good. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, definitely uneventful, and um, so I felt – yeah, I felt solid down towards the bottom. Um, the one thing it's interesting, um, the river, you know how it's just like that murky Brown. Oh, it was way Brown. It's, uh, oh, I haven't seen it night, a nice blue for a while. Like yeah. it's, it's really cool when it's kind of this greenish blue. Um, but the last couple of times I've been down, it's, it's been that murky Brown. So it's Seasonality, like, it's, you think is the biggest part of that or I, I'm trying to figure it out. Cause I've, I've been down there in April. Multi, a couple times, May, a couple times. Uh, I went down in March. Um, I specifically looked at the river when I was crossing, like driving home, like by Lee's Ferry. Yeah, it looked nice and blue. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. It so did it, look good. It must but... get turned up, you know, from, yeah. from either between there with rapids or maybe it is like rain or, or yeah. I'm, I'm sure it has a lot to do with just the, the cubic feet of water at the time, right? Yeah. Oh, you know, one thing I, I noticed really quickly, probably about three-fourths of the way down, um, you know, I said I was feeling good. I was, however, like, and this was a, a bad omen that, like, four miles into it, that that's when I started noticing my feet were, like, rubbing really bad on my heels. I had made a last-minute shoe change, um, because like the week prior, I had done a couple hikes, and my shoes were kind of putting a lot of pressure on the outside, kind of that knuckle of the ankle, that kind of ball, and like it was putting a lot of pressure and swelling it. And so I thought, well, hundred miles, you know, in the Grand Canyon, I don't want to do that. So I had a couple other pair of shoes that I hike or run with frequently. So I thought, well, I better maybe I'll take those both pairs and then kind of flip a coin as to which one I start the hike with. And I can always change shoes when I get back, you know, from the first round. Um, but yeah, the, the shoes I chose were, they're a pretty precise fit and they were really like my heels started getting a ton of pressure. And so I could just start to feel like the hot spots. Um, but aside from that, yeah, wasn't, wasn't feeling they, they were your Too bad Sauconies? Okay. Yeah, I cho- I was running in Saucony Peregrines or hiking in Saucony Peregrines hmm. on the way down. Yeah, I, I personally haven't tried those, but that's that's never fun, especially when you're like under 10 miles into a potentially 100-mile <laughs> effort. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, we get to the bottom. Um, I thought, I, like, I didn't, I didn't know what to expect with this group. Yeah. Um, you know, talking about like, like me and you started the hike together and then you peel off to use the restroom and like, I didn't see you and I was like, Oh, we'll, we'll see him at the bottom, you know, type of thing. And then yeah. like, just never saw you because everyone was, was moving quickly. It was, it was very apparent that this, that the group was, was minimizing any kind of stopping time. They were trying to basically hike or hike as fast as they could, you know? And I don't, I don't know. I guess I, I'm curious. I don't know if you have a thought on this, but like I couldn't tell if they were hiking as fast as they could just to, I don't know, like make the hike harder or if it was they're hiking fast because they want, they knew they had to do it twice and there was like a bit of a timeline on it or if they're just hiking fast because like egos. And well, <laughs> I, yeah. I, I, yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't get a, you know, get a gauge on it either. Cause it's like, I think it could have been any, any of those, because like a lot of them had never even been here before, or been to the Grand Canyon before, um, and so you know, just thinking back to some of the times like when we did the rim to rim to rim, you know, a um, couple years back as a company, there were guys that had not been there before, and it's really easy to feel like, oh yeah, I can really speed up, you know. Mm-hmm. So there's like maybe that element, and then there is the element of like. Like you said, maybe they were, they're kind of anticipating, well, like, I got to do this twice in over the next 48 hours or whatever, and so I better hurry. Um, and I also, I, I do think, you know, 
um, having gone with that group and kind of looking back on it, I, for sure there's the element of like the the group mentality that kind of like the group pushes itself, yeah. you know, whether it's by design or not. You know, there's l- a lot that. of driven guys, you know, and um, and and so like I think there's just mm-hmm. a lot of that psychological dynamic of like people they don't want to look like they're slow. So they're just going to keep pace. And then some people like, you know, they don't like feeling like somebody's behind them so that they, they always feel like they have to push forward. And I, it's probably just a combination of everything. Um, Mm -hmm. but they were, yeah, there was definitely a, a push for speed. (laughs) Yeah. More, more to come on that as the day progressed. But I, I guess my biggest surprise is just like, yeah, like I, you peeled off behind and I, I didn't see it. And like, we filled up water at Phantom Ranch, which is basically at the bottom, pretty close to the Colorado River there, and um, it's kind of the bigger city. So down in the bottom of the Grand Canyon, you have this little city. Like there's cabins down there, there's a general store, and there's a bunch of, of camping spots. So definitely like the biggest camping area, I would say, in the Grand Canyon and the most facilities, right? And so um, <clears throat> it's a great place to typically stop, grab water, and, and you know, and move on. And then if you're there in the middle of the day, you can, you can go into the little general store and Hey, apparently they take credit cards now and Apple pay and all sorts of things. So oh, really? Just so you know, yeah, it I used to be, you'd have to bring cash. Yeah. That's what I thought. Um, so be aware that you may, you know, maybe we'll just tap your phone have my these wallet, days, so which is crazy. Work. Yeah. <laughs> I had specifically thrown 20 bucks in my pack yeah. cash because I was like, Oh, it might be nice. But, um, yeah, even though I was there and I could have, it didn't didn't end up working out for me to, to stop to slow down at all to get lemonade. Um, but yeah, so you've got Phantom Ranch down there. That's again where we had stayed the previous time we we'd done this, and um, yeah, so like I thought I'd just see you at Phantom Ranch, and you know, just wasn't the case. Like people were moving so quick, and people were. I was really impressed because what happens typically in a big group setting is you, everyone like you do a break, you do a stop. And everyone takes a little bit more time and it's really slow to get back moving again. Yeah. Whereas these people were dialed. I was like, I came in with basically my ultra running mentality of like a pit stop, which is like, I have my Ziploc bags. I mix my drinks super fast. I fill them up, throw them back in my pack. I repack the front of my pack where I've got my calories in the fast pack and I'm gone. And I, somehow it usually takes longer than I feel like it should, but maybe 15 minute stops. Right. So we're, so, but, but I was like slow for these guys, like 15 minute stops. They were like, they were ready to go, um, which always surprised me, but I was definitely like mixing a bunch of drinks, whereas they were just like maybe filling water or, or things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, had a super quick pit stop there and then we're, we're cruising up. So from there, from Phantom Ranch, essentially move up to, we'll just, we'll just go to Manzanita. It's about a, I don't know, eight to 10 mile push from Phantom Ranch to Manzanita and you are climbing the whole time, but it's it's more of a gradual climb, right? A, a, yeah. And so um, coming out of there, my plan the whole time was don't run down South Kaibab. If you want to push, like run or push in the flat bottom section. And then obviously you're hiking up. And then on the way back, it's like, well, again, that section, if you want to move fast, that's the section to move fast in to get back down to Phantom Branch. So I left that section. Those runners had already like like that had run down South Cabab, they were gone. I didn't even see them at the stop either. Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking, man, these, there's some guys that are out there. You know, let me, I'll push and just be, try to, to catch up a little bit to them. And so I start jogging and then I jog into this group. And um, it, it was, dude, oh, I was going to say this. It was, so I, I had I had a lot of great experiences. A lot of these guys were so focused. I don't think they even looked at the canyon. I was filming and enjoying a lot of yeah. stuff. Dude, it was I saw nice. some massive fish in that smaller Creek um, that came from Manzanita. I know. I've always wondered about that and kind of look because it's a beautiful creek. It's the the I think it's Bright Angel Creek. But another guy um, that I kind of passed up on the way back down, Jared. Um, I think that was he's Jared. like he showed me. He's like, dude, there's a bunch of trout in there. And I'm like, what? You know? And he showed me. I mean, he took he filmed it, and yeah. it was cool to see that there's there's see, trout I, in there. I didn't see. I didn't look super close. But this guy that I was with, uh, I think it was Jared. He was saying that they were some kind of a sucker fish, um, I, the ones that we were looking at. Like I they were like too. There was like 10 in a little cluster, and they were yeah, big. Yeah, I believe that, too. Um, but he's like, but I don't know what kind they are. I need to look it up. And, mm. yeah, but it's pretty interesting. I hadn't, I hadn't seen those fish before in there. And So, yeah, we're kind of pushing because it's really cool. As you leave Phantom Branch, you get into this, like, box canyon kind of thing where it's just 
it's you've uh, I wouldn't call it a slot canyon because it's not that narrow, but it, it's just got these big tall walls yeah, it's a on very, each side. Yeah, very high wall and windy. Like it's wow. really windy, like big drawn curves. So like you can't you can't see if you fun. look forward, you just see like a wall. Mm-hmm. It's pretty cool. And it's and I always think of everything in the Grand Canyon is going to be like red rock, but this is like black rock, right? It's like yeah. dark rock, and so it's a really really cool section. And so I start pushing. Um, was hiking with this guy named Jared, and I'm like, I'm gonna I'm gonna jog a little and try to just catch up to to some people. And he's like, I'll I'll go with you. So he started jogging with me. And we catch up to this group, and we, <laughs> but like we weren't pushing, we were not pushing hard. Like this is like a very slow paced jog, right? Um, you know, 13, 14 minute type miles, right? Just shuffling along, and we start catching up to this group, and I see him up ahead of us, and they're kind of jogging too, but two of them are jogging, and one is walking, and I'm like. I'm like looking at this and then I'd like kind of put my head down, look around, keep jogging for a minute. I'd look back up. Two of them are jogging. One is walking. And I'm like, what is going on? Like, it was the strangest hmm. thing. So finally we catch up to them and I'm like, so we're kind of matching their pace and I'm having to kind of shuffle and jog. And this guy in front of me is just walking. And I'm like, what, how are you doing this? Right? So I start like, I start trying to like copy his walk just to see if it was even like possible for me to do. This guy had the fastest, most dialed in walk I've ever seen. <laughs> he was walking like 14 to 13 minute miles and he was making it look like he was just strolling, right? He wasn't trying that hard. He didn't, yeah, That's he did impressive. not look like I he was trying. I can't walk very fast. He wasn't, it was, so, I mean, he just got this, and he wasn't taller than me. He didn't have like massively long legs, um, but he just, he just opened up like this big, long stride and had his poles, you know, he's pumping on his poles and... It was just, it, I don't know. It was for some, I, I pointed it out to him and just laughed. Like I just, I was like, I don't know how you, he's like, oh yeah, I've like dialed in this walk, man. <laughs> like it was like, a, a, he was like very aware that he had this uh, superpower. That's pretty cool. Because <laughs> we're all just shuffling along, it. you know, and I, I, don't, I was like, man, I wonder if that like, I almost feel like sometimes over striding like that, like hurts my knees more than just doing like a little shuffle and, and. And doing like a higher cadence, but man, it was, it was, I mean, I, I just had to call that out. It was very impressive. Hmm. Um, apparently I was like, I mean, I've, I've run some, I'll see something where there's like, like walking races, <laughs> you know, like this guy, he, he could enter one of those things. He, he had a dial, but, um, so yeah, meet up with this group and, and I, we just kind of stuck together. So we, we, um, yeah, we're pushing probably. I, th- I would say we at, we're averaging a little under like 15 minute miles and, and just pushing. But I was, I didn't realize that that is a climb. It is a climb from Phantom to Manzanita. It's not like it's, it's um like flat on the bottom of the canyon. Yeah. I want to say you climb almost 2,000 feet. I think yeah. I think the most gradual part is that <clears throat> narrow windy candy or uh, canyon canyon. <clears throat> but I think once it opens up, I think it it is a bit deceiving that how much incline there is because there's a few like like i don't know three or four hundred long yard long like kind of just no switchbacks just climbs mm-hmm. um yeah it's a good it's a good climb that stretch yeah really pretty though we were kind of expecting i was i kept looking up being like oh i wonder if we're gonna get the rain clouds coming in because it was about nine coming up on right around nine o'clock and you know in that canyon at least especially facing that direction or not you couldn't see anything. It was just blue skies. It was I'm like, nice. man, what, it was what's pretty. going on? Like, this is supposed to be crazy weather, you know, and whatnot. But no, just cruised up the bottom. Really pretty trail. Just talking, getting to know those guys. Um, you know, they were from all over, Montana, Colorado, Oregon. Um, so just meeting a lot of people, swapping stories and, and moving up the canyon. Um, and yeah, just, just went that way until we got to Manzanita. But how was your hike, I guess, from... From Phantom and, and onward. Yeah. I had, uh, like I said, I caught up to a group. Again, it's it's not the whole group. It's just, there's just kind of like groups spread out, right? So there's probably four other guys besides me, um, about a mile or two from the bottom. So then we got to the bottom and watered up. <clears throat> and uh, we got held up a little bit because um, one of the guys that kind of organized it got uh, thoroughly interrogated by a ranger who had, who had, yeah. she like admittedly said, I don't ever come down into the canyon and I'm new, but I came down last night just so I could be here to check your permit. 
And she was like Insane. very thoroughly like Insane. asking all the questions. And then she actually ended up forgetting to actually handle his permit and look at it. And then she came back while we were filling up water. She's like, I forgot <laughs> so you to totally check your permit. left. Well, oh well yeah, she like dismissed us, you know. Oh. So she was waiting for us at the bridge. Right, right. Because when I went by, she's like, are you Steve? Are you Steve? <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was funny. I mean, that was definitely a delay, but it was it was interesting. and That makes more sense to me why I didn't see you guys at Phantom Ranch because I didn't feel like you were much behind us. So. Yeah, yeah. So she was, you know, she did this whole interrogation at the bridge and then <laughs> dismissed us. We walk over to that first water station. We're all watering up and kind of talking about it and... She came back. It's like, oh, I forgot to check your permit, even though I was asking you all these questions. She's like, I am new, and I never do this, and I never come down here. And this one guy, I forget who it was, he goes, so, he's like, so are you like a GS7, which is like the government – it's like a government hierarchy or, or pay scale. GS7 is technically like a pay scale, but like GS7 is – two notches above the lowest government scale, which is like, I was like, ooh, is that going to, she going to like be offended or- catch that and yeah. be offended? And she's like, yes, I am a GS7. Because, I mean, the GS scale goes up to 15, and then there's other scales above that. So it was like, it was pretty. <laughs> It was pretty. I tried to. I had to like look away and try to not laugh. But anyway, so, we we got it second. Uh, he we got the group. It was all just kind of like hanging out to just watch all of this. It was pretty funny. Anyway, we got dismissed again, and uh, then. But I did get to hike with that that group. Well, um, just before we move on from that, I think the the comedy, the other part of the comedy of that is like. Like the permit to go down in there with a bigger group, which by the way, like we were so separated. We were never one time with more than like five people hiking together. Oh, yeah. Never, right? And so I think the permit they said was like well under $100 or something. It's really just like a notification of, hey, we have a bigger group coming. Mm -hmm. So to like send someone down there on the clock, hike all the way down there, spend the night, check a permit and hike all the way back, like like they lost money. You know what I mean? Like, like it costs totally. way more money to pay a, a GS7 to do I that. I don't even think – I didn't – she didn't say, I don't think she hiked. I think she rode a mule. Oh. She was spick and span clean. I mean, she's like, I work at a desk. She said that. She's like, uh, I'm an admin person. I work at a desk. Hmm. I mean, and it, it showed, hmm. but uh, it was pretty funny. But, yeah, total waste of money and time, but <laughs> – <laughs> Yeah, it was solid. It was pretty funny. Yeah, that is. But, Last thing I remember th- seeing is just there's a lot of people that start moving out of those camps early in the morning, and I don't know if you thought the same thing, but a lot of big backpacks. Oh, a lot of big backpacks, <laughs> and uh, that is, I guess, that is a popular thing to do is to just go to the Bright Angel Campground, which is right outside Phantom Ranch, um, and then hike out. Mm-hmm. I think maybe people might do like it as a two nighter and do like little day trips up to parts of the canyon, but there's definitely outgoing traffic. Um, and typically, I think a lot of the outgoing traffic goes up the Bright Angel Trail, but again, it was closed. So now, yeah, um, there was a lot of you know traffic coming out, but there were some really large, large packs um, on people. You know, climbing up out of there. So I always, I always love it because I'm always like going through so cheery, like "Hey, good morning," and then <laughs> you don't get the same greeting back most no, of the time. No, you don't. They're grinding up this hill. I mean, and they're only like a mile in of like a five, six mile climb. It's like this is going to be an all day. Yeah, and they're, I, I mean, they're carrying like a good eighty liters of pack. Like, can only hold three and a, light. three, three <laughs> foot tall packs. You know that yeah. even if you. you very conservative math. They're like fifty plus pounds. You know? Yeah, we don't advise but, that. But anyways, no. it was, so you passed. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we got released by the ranger again, and but so I did get to hike for I don't know, probably five six miles with with a group, which was which was great. It was you know we were making great time, and um, so uh, let's like see. Past Phantom Ranch, you were hiking with them still. Yeah, all the way to about. Well, yeah, I hiked with the group all the way till Manzanita. Now, a couple people had peeled off to relieve themselves or whatever. 
Um, but I rolled into Manzanita, I think, around there with at least a couple people. Um, but most of the group had um, either slowed down or stopped to relieve themselves on the side of the trail. And But, uh, I mean, so I, I got to hike with people for a few miles, which was – it was cool. And, you know, that that's a stretch that you can really be efficient with your time um, as long as you don't have to stop to, you know, use the bathroom or whatever. But, yeah, yeah, that, that takes us – I mean, that was to Manzanita. I did feel bad. Um, one of the guys was walking in front of me, Jory, and – I uh, I saw a big snake on the trail, and I was like, snake, you know, and he didn't do anything. Like, snake, you know, he didn't do anything. So I'm like, hey, he snake. <laughs> and by the time he finally registered what I was saying and looks down, he's standing on top of the snake, right? <laughs> so he just jumps, like, straight in the air. You know, the snake's just, like, totally non, like, chill, totally chilled out, right? Not like it was coiled up or, like, a threat. And he just launches in the air, and I'm like, Man, I'm sorry. I just should have said nothing. Like, you would have walked right past it, like, without anything. Instead, I scared you to death by making you realize there's a snake as you're stepping right over it. But there's was a big bull snake. It was like, I want to say it was five foot. It was a big, Dang, big that's snake. Cool. Yeah, I've, um, I've never even seen a snake down there. So. Yeah. I, like I say, I felt bad, though, man. He launched into the air. <laughs> so, I, um, <clears throat> so I get up to Manzanita. Um, again, just a, an efficient stop. But Manzanita marks off like the the start of the North Rim climb. Like it's like that where as soon as you leave there, you are climbing up. Yeah. Um, so it's it's um yeah, like that section of the bottom, it's kind of the nice, most peaceful section. Kind of a I look at it as a bit of a rejuvenating section, and I'll talk more about that as far as just maybe strategy if you're ever going into the canyon later. But like really nice section. You get to Manzanita, it has these big, beautiful trees. Um, but when I was there, the wind started whipping. Um, people's gear was getting blown around. Um, there was like a metal roof on a on a building that's down in there, um, and that thing sounded like it was going to rip off. Like it was like vibrating. Yeah. Like you know, it was mm-hmm. like holy smokes. So we we're starting to get some some big gusts. Um, I don't know, like at that point, how how strong they were, but like thirty plus mile an hour gusts pretty easily, and. Um, yeah, we start gearing up and it starts cooling off, right? So um, I threw the the Nebo windbreaker on, um, and and just yeah, that was that was it. Really started started climbing, knowing like, all right, I've done this climb before. It kicked my butt last time. Um, we had some some guys in our group that it was kicking their butts, cramping up, and I kind of got it was a much slower pace the last time. But like by the time we got to the top, I was starting to to have to slow down to not cramp up, and so. I knew it was going to be one of those. And so I was, I was being pretty careful, I guess, leading up to it. And, um, but I was excited to get back on it. And, and again, that like running group that had run on the South Kaibab, still not in sight, S- still gone. Right. And I'm like, man, they, they really are cruising. If we were just clicking off like 14 minute miles climbing up here, and then we stopped for 15 plus minutes to, to, you know, repack our bags and fuel up, um, and so they're, they got to be 20 minutes ahead of us minimum plus then our 15 minutes, yeah. you know, so you start thinking like, man, they're really, they're really cruising. Yeah. Moving along fast. Um, but yeah, we start to climb, um, at this point, there's a few other people on the trail doing either coming up from the bottom to just do the North Rim that day, or there was one group of, of women and these, these girls impressed the heck out of me. Like, yeah. I hope that I'm doing this when, when I'm, you know, late forties, fifties, um, but this group of three, four, women, four women, um, were cruising up the, the, the North rim as well. So a few people out there, but we started climbing and it started to get Western real quick. Um, started to get like 40 plus mile an hour gusts and, um, like the Nebo was like, I mean, you're climbing, like we were climbing fast and like, it was like just enough. Like it was about, it was about the perfect piece of gear. Like maybe I could have had something on my hands. They were probably the only part that was really cold, but, um, it started snowing on us a little, hailing on us a little, raining a little bit, getting these massive gusts. Um, there's a few spots on the North Rim too, that like have a pretty good ledge drop off. And, um, I don't, I don't typically feel like I'm someone who's like scared of heights. Um, but what's funny is like, there's one particular edge where there's, I don't know, easily 500 foot drop. 
And I kind of like leaned out just a little and looked off of it. And the guy with me, he's like right on the edge, like, oh, you know, just looking off. And he's like, he's a, he's a funny dude. Uh, Tyler He's just, he's uh, hanging off the edge. And, and uh, I'm like, man, that's great. And like, I kind of like mentally noted, noted like, dude, that's like, I'm a little uncomfortable on this edge. Right. <laughs> yeah. It was funny is like fast forward to later that night when I laid down to close my eyes that image showed up in my head very first thing. I'm like, clearly that had an impression on me, right? Hmm. 40 mile an hour gusts on this trail above a 500 to 1,000 foot drop, you know. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, uh, other, than, other than that though, just just cruised up the trail. Me and Tyler were, were hiking together and we just locked into a speed and were able to hold that the whole way up. Um, maybe a mile from the top, we started to run into like snow and a little bit of different cadence. And you get to that point where you're like, man, I, I think the top's here. And mentally, I, mentally I was ready to be at the top. Um, but for the most part, our hike went pretty smooth, but this was kind of the funny part. I think of the story is again, I'm, I'm like new to this group. I don't know what's going on, I guess with, with their inner workings of, cause they've, these are all guys that have done this hike. Yeah. They all know before, each other. Right. Yeah. And so I'm kind of asking, I'm like, man, Tyler, like, are these guys going to be able to like hold this speed the whole time? Like they're cruising. Are they, are they going to blow up? Are they not? Like, are these guys like super proven with their, you know, and he's like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But we literally get to the last straightaway before we get to the North Rim parking lot and we can see the last one in their group. And he's like, oh, like he, first he tells me to be quiet. He's like, shh. Like, cause he like wants to sneak up on him. And I'm like, okay, you know? So then we get up there, we watch him like walk into the parking lot. And then he's like, all right, run. And I'm like, what? He's like, run into the parking lot, snap a photo and run out. And I'm like, why? He's like, we're going to take their souls right now. <laughs> so he says to me, which, which for those that don't know, that's a David Goggins quote, like, right. Um, essentially it's like, yeah, by us like passing them in in the manner that we pass them, like like trying to demoralize them, essentially be like, no, you're not you're not the fastest guy on the mountain today, type of thing. So clearly, like there was some inner workings with uh, this guy named Dan and, and Tyler, where I think they had, they get a little competitive with each other. They, yeah, they know how to <laughs> how to push each other's buttons. So it was funny because sure, so we we jog we jog up the hill into the parking lot snap a photo and they're like oh like you're gonna sit down and tyler's like nope we're tagging and going and he turns to go and dan, dan's face is like oh and he like i think he hit it anthony was next to him and is like are we gonna go and he's like no 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 i need to eat or something <laughs> you know? and so we leave and it was like it was just it was really comp tyler was just laughing like as we get like far enough out he's like that was awesome that was so good like did you see their faces um but I mean, just from also another point is Tyler had asked me, like, do you want to stay at the top? And I was like, no, I don't want to stay there. It's freaking cold, frozen parking lot of snow. Yeah. Um, I would rather tag it, come down at least a little ways and then stop if we need to there. It's not like there's water there or anything. There's nothing for you there except for you're at the coldest part of the hike. Yeah. Um, so anyways, that was my experience getting to the North Rim. Uh, <laughs> well, and the, and the North Rim is like, it's a very... It's not a I, – I, I guess if there wasn't snow there and it was really nice and warm, it would be, like, kind of pleasant to hang out for a little bit. But it's also, like, kind of anticlimactic when you're there because you, you're you're there, but you can't see anything out. Like, you can't look back behind you towards the, the canyon and really get much of a view. Your trees. It's interesting because it's, like, it's a big obstacle to – to get past, you know, to overcome and to, you know, it's a good milestone, but like you get there though. And psychologically you're like, I have no reason to be here. So I guess I'll just turn around. But yeah, first time I got there, that was my feeling was like South rim. Like you are on the edge of the rim and you have massive it's views. Magnificent. So I thought the North rim would be the same. And it's like, yeah. Oh, I can see a hundred yards and trees and, and a road woods. and an outhouse. You yeah. Know, like, yeah. Um, yeah, well, when I so when I got into Manzanita, um, that was the first time I'd seen you since I probably before I peeled off to use the the restroom. Yep. Because we spread out, um, but uh, yeah, so it was just like a quick hey, and uh, that was like like you said, the wind started ripping, and you could feel it was now a cold wind, and uh, so that was interesting. So that there's a water spigot there that you can get drinking water. So. I mean, that, a lot of people, that's the main thing to do there. Um, but I had developed 
a blister on each of my heels that I, I guess like my mistake was that I should have stopped a few miles earlier when it was just a hot spot and tried to tape it or at least change my socks or lace my shoes differently. But I, you know, I, I wanted to get, to get ahead a little bit to, to Manzanito and, and be more efficient with my stops and, you know, get water and some, eat some snacks while I'm doing all that. So yeah, I, so I filled up my water and it is, that's the only water station. Um, there's nothing at the top. So you basically have like a 14 ish mile stretch cause you have to go up to the rim and then back down. Um, Specifically for us on this trip though. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so for water, that's your last water until you come back past that water source. So it's about 14 miles. So um, every, I think most people were not just filling up just the bottles they'd been using, but also filling up extra. I filled up an extra two liter bladder. Um, so that took some time and takes everybody time. So I had to stop and then I thought, well, yeah, I better, you know, um, kind of resituate some snacks and, and food in my pockets, um, just different types of calories. Um, cause again, it was going to be a 14 mile stretch and then, um, uh, you know, mix some electrolyte mix. And then also because it was getting so windy, I could feel it being cold. Clouds were darkening, um, got out a windbreaker. I had just been hiking in like just an altitude hoodie at that point. Um, but I knew I was, I knew it was going to be really cold up top. So planned accordingly, got out the windbreaker. And even though I knew it looked like really dark clouds, I just did not want to, you know, I wasn't going to be putting on a rain jacket, like just want to do that, hold off on that as long as possible. So got the windbreaker out and then I'm like, well, yeah, now I got to take my shoes and socks off, try to tape up my heels. Um, I keep some Luco tape in my, in my kit. And uh, I also had an extra pair of socks. So I thought I'd try to just do as much as I could to, to help my feet. So I take my shoes off. So I'm sitting there kind of leaning up against this sign thing and I'm barefoot. And then I get one heel taped and then the rain just unleashed. So it just started blowing rain. And, uh, so then I was trying to tape my other heel and like, it was just getting rained on. So it was just a wet foot. And so the Luco tape was not sticking. And so I tried that for like a few more seconds. I'm like, well, this is not even worth it. So I tried to hurry and pack up everything up, uh, everything else up just so it wasn't getting wet, but it was a long stop and it was a bit frustrating, but I mean, it's crazy. Like the group dynamic was so driven. Like, I mean, I, there was nobody in sight by the time I left, like everybody was gone. So, um, Dude, yeah, pe- that was people weren't messing around. So I actually took, I have like, a, I had a 360 camera and as soon as we got in there, I took it and turned it on. Yeah. And just left it on the table while I was doing stuff. Yeah. Some of these other guys, like one guy had his shoe off, his socks off, all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm good. You know what I mean? All I'm doing is mixing drinks. Yeah. And repacking my front bag. And somehow that stop turned into, I think the camera's on for about 18 minutes. I'm like, that seemed f- like, like it goes so mm. fast, right? And yeah. I, I mean, I didn't sit down. I didn't do yeah. anything. I just repacked my bag, maybe used the restroom maybe put on additional layer of clothing. I probably, I think I put the Nebo on there, but like I so I'm thinking I'm ahead of all these guys. Like this guy's got a shoe off. No, man, he's up on his feet, shoes back on. He's ready to go before I am. I'm like, these guys are efficient. Like yeah. they are fast. Yeah. I was, I was impressed by that. I mean, cause that stop turned into a way longer stop than I wanted it to. Um, but, uh, I'm trying to think, yeah, that wind was really moving because at that point, so now I'm kind of like, I kind of wanted to do like kind of a brunch, like a moving brunch um, where I was eating more variety of things um, to try to get some fuel in the body. It was going to be a little bit slower burning, but also get some faster burning things in like right now because it's just a straight up climb for the next five or six miles or whatever, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and then also get a substantial amount of electrolytes in my, in my water. And, um, but there, so I remember now when I got to Manzanita, Mark and Steve had both gotten behind me. They, I think they both at different times stopped to use the bathroom. That's right. Cause I'd asked um, where they were, remember. But like, it was like by the time I was 
taken my socks off. Like they they stopped and did nothing but get water. I don't. They don't mix anything. They A lot of these guys anything. weren't mixing it. They do and salt caps and Steve, stuff. Steve, I am pretty sure, did not stop at the water. Wow. Like wow. I saw Mark get water, but somebody next to Mark's like, there goes Steve, and he just kept going. Whoa. So, but I could they, be they wrong. They were aware, though, that this is like, what, yeah. like a 14-mile dry yeah. stretch. Yeah. I mean. Anyway, but uh, yeah, that that climb was, so my mentality with that climb was to just go just steady, like moderate, steady pace, um, and not like, not push pace, um, but, but also not slow down. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I would say at that point, um, I was getting, I was feeling pretty good about how my like fueling and hydration strategy was going. I, you know, more later on the hydration strategy, but like, um, so it was good, but I was, yeah, I was by myself, like <laughs> the whole way up the North Rim and, Love that. um, like, you know, there's, haven't done it, you know, before there's like certain milestones on the way up where you look by and you kind of compare how you feel and where you are time wise. And, but I did, you know, I was, as I was getting, I think probably like a mile or two from the top, I started thinking, okay, feels like people should start be coming down past Mm -hmm. me now. Mm -hmm. And, and that was the case, like for like the next mile, um, you know, I could, everybody that was ahead of me was working their way down. Um, there were a few gusts of wind though that were, I mean, they were moving me. Yeah. They were physically moving me. Um, it was, it was impressive how strong that wind was. Um, and luckily, and I say luckily, like the rain changed to like this really dry, like balls of snow. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like nearly hail, nearly snow. yeah. Yeah. And it was windy enough that like, the Nebo was the perfect piece for that climb because just on top of an, an altitude, um, I, I took my hat off to to lose heat on purpose. And so I was like just going from, you know, no hood to a hood. And then when I'd get a little bit hot, I'd take the hood off. And then, um, but like I just, I mentioned before, I, I do not want to put a rain jacket on as much as possible. And it Especially was perfect. Climbing. It was perfect because I never had to, but the windbreaker – was like just enough to keep me from getting wet. And it was never really that wet anyway. But then when it was snow, it was just bouncing off, you know? And so I think it was there's a good some, setup. It really is. And the thing that I also like about the Nebo for that climb and for like even that like slightly damp conditions is um, because it's a, such a thin fabric and because it's like, like a woven, not a knit, it does like repel the water or the snow a little bit better. It's the, because we don't have to use any, like really any uh, treatments on it, it breathes really well. Right. Mm -hmm. But then, um, there's no risk. There's, there's such a low risk for it getting wet because it's not your jacket. It's not your insulation. It's not. So if you do sweat in it or it gets rained on, like, yeah, you like, like, cause like you get these little, sometimes you get these little storms in the West where you're just like, it's only going to rain for 10 minutes. Like, do I really want to stop? And like the Nebo, the thing that I realized after that is like, it's so low risk because even if it got wet, it's not your actual insulation piece. And also it dries out so fast yep. that um, I just love that about it. And, and I was thinking about that on this hike. I'm like, like it's it's perfect for this because it, otherwise I'd be worried about, let's say it was even the Ventus. Yeah. You're really like, well, I don't want the insulation to get wet and, and two layers of fabric to get wet, you know, because then you got to dry out two layers of fabric yeah, and, and the that's, insulation. Yeah, that's weight that it's holding onto. Yeah, yeah, it's for, especially for a, a trip where you're, you do have to do higher miles. So efficiency is way, it comes into play way more significantly. It's, it is a great piece because, um, yeah, cause you can, you never have to stop to take it off. Um, and it's low risk because like you said, if it gets wet, it doesn't compromise anything, right? Yeah. It doesn't compromise your, your safety or your, your and temperature regulation. That thing, I think, I think one last thing with that is like, you could call this a wind shirt, like, right? you'll see that sometimes out there. Like, mm-hmm. and it, and it really is because I think sometimes when you say a, like a windbreaker jacket, it feels way more substantial, heavy, yeah. thick, unbreathable. Um, you could literally wear this like it was a shirt. It's like that breathable and light. Uh, it's lighter than almost all of your guys' shirts out there. Right. So, so just keep that in mind. And there's actually more on clothing and gear that I want to 
touch on at the end. Yeah, um, and safety gear specifically. So let's come, let's come back to that. But yeah, I felt the same way. And, and personally I was, I, I was very happy with the wind and the cold and the rain because I was like, like at one point I was like, oh man, this kind of sucks. I was like, you know what? It really doesn't because if it was hot, me personally, and if you, if you followed the podcast a while, you know, I sweat like crazy. Oh man. It was so nice to not be overheating and then worrying about, I've got to drink more and more water. Mm -hmm. I've got to hydrate better. I've Mm -hmm. got to take the time to mix more electrolytes. Mix mix. more drinks. And so it was, it was so much easier this whole day for me to stay hydrated. Usually on an effort like this, I'm thinking I need to drink about uh, a liter and a half of water per hour. But I, I think I got away with maybe a liter of water an hour, which was just so much more manageable for me. Um, So I was like thankful, like, yes, it's, cold and it's snowy, but the views were amazing. Like to just get that disparity of colors coming in and clouds swirling around and then to have it cooler worked in my favor in the grand scheme of things. I think some people would be like, man, that was the worst. But to me, I was like, dude, this is awesome. Awesome. It was you got the right gear. Cool. It's awesome. <laughs> well, and it was cool. Cause like you had the joggers on, you'd too. get, I, yeah, I you'd get, get like a, a little spray of rain. Well, most of the way up, it was like hail or snow. And then like the sun would the sun would like peek through for a couple minutes and then it would cloud up, but it was like it was really cool. Yeah. So And the views on that north rim, they're it's a really cool canyon. It's like this like you kinda climb up this main one up to Manzanita and then you take a left up a side canyon and really pretty waterfalls shooting out of the side of the mountain. It greens up. You you go into you, at the top you get into Ponderosas. So yeah. just a really a pretty trail. Um so if you can if you can unclick from the the brutalness of the climbing it's beautiful <laughs> yeah and it's like yeah you might as well yeah i mean it, it, it is what it is it's it's gonna be physically demanding on the way up so you might as well how many times have you done that up the hike up three three yeah was yeah. it windy on the one that i wasn't there for i'm wondering if not, that canyon is always windy uh, it was it was windy but like breezy not strong okay. wind advisory windy um, okay. just just breezy okay but okay. Yeah, I started. Yeah, people started passing me, coming back down the other way. And but when I got, I'm trying to think, I was pretty surprised that there was a couple people that I caught up to. One of them wasn't feeling very well. Um, but when I got up to the top, yeah, there were like a couple other hikers up there. Yeah, like not in our group. There were some some hikers just hanging out. Um, and then I I grabbed a couple more snacks, just resituated everything. Um, dumped water from my bladder back into my water bottles. So I had those readily accessible. Um, yeah. Enjoyed a couple snacks up there. Was but there, there wasn't water though, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. No, I just used the, the two liter bladder I'd hauled oh, up oh, okay. and then dumped that into my bottles, um, yeah. just so I could grab them real quick. But yeah, I was, it was a quick, quick stop. Cause it was very cold up there. It, it, it was snowing, the wind was blowing and it was, it's, two, I don't know, two feet of snow up there, something like that. It was cold. Yeah. Um, so when I started coming down, cause like, again, like you mentioned, I saw you in Manzanita. You were like one of the first people kind of coming in behind. We left. So I'm thinking, oh, I'm 15 minutes or something ahead of Brigham. Um, and I've always known you to be the guy that's like, you're always going to stick with whoever you're with. Like if someone wants to go super fast, you just stick on their tail and go fast with them. And um, you know, one of just the most strongest, consistent hikers I know of. And we started to go down and we started to pass some people that I hadn't seen at Manzanita. And dude, I started to talk to, to Tyler cause he's still with me. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, something's wrong with Brigham. Something happened to him. No one passes Brigham on a hill. What's <laughs> going on? You know, I, I like legitimately was like, and then like we pass a few more and I, I was like, dude, something happened to Brigham. I was convinced of it. So if, when we saw you, I was like, oh, oh, that makes sense. Like you're taping your foot and all this stuff. But, but again, you were also pacing. You've done this hike. No one else has done this on this whole group. Um, and you were pacing to do it a second time around. But, dude, I had like a moment there where I'm like, something happened. Like I was like actually getting nervous. I was like, dude, this is – something's going on. Um, but, yeah, taping taping foot in the, in the rain it would not be fun. Um, so come down the north rim. So we, I mean, obviously we had we had gapped this front group. <clears throat> we'll call it the Dan group because he's kind of the leader of this little cohort of of three four people. And because they had stopped, I mean they were they were eating, packs off, sitting there. 
we'd left and, um, you know, we'd looked up a little behind us and hadn't seen him. So me and, me and Tyler were just cruising down the trail, making good time, not running, not anything. Um, it kind of seemed like maybe Tyler was being just, he's just being real careful, like trying to really weight the poles and, 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 and rightly so I was trying to do the same, but we got most of the way down the, the Canyon and all of a sudden just right up behind us comes running in, uh, Dan and this group were like, holy smokes. Like you guys ran down the North Rim now or like, what's going on? He's like, oh yeah, we saw you like clear down there and we've been hoofing it to catch you, you know? And they were, they ran, they when when, when I was almost to the top, they mm-hmm. were running down. Really? They, they were running down. In the snow? That stuff yeah. was slick. Yeah. Um, dang. So yeah, they, they caught us and then they, they stopped and hiked with us and it was like, but I think they just like, it felt like they, they wanted to be in the lead group. They wanted to be in the lead. And, um, so we were hiking with them for a little bit. We get to Manzanita. I do a full stop again, you know, resituate. They stop for like three, four minutes, maybe like they, like you say, they just filled up water really. And then they just go. And, um, so they get out and head. And so we start going and, um, and, um, I started kind of running. I'm like, this is, this is an opportunity for me for just training for like this hundred mile ultra and stuff. I'm like, I got 30 miles on my legs. How often do I really have a chance to just kind of open up and run a slight downhill when I'm this far in? So, um, so I'm like, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to run up and catch those dudes. So, so I, I start jogging and, and I'm like, I'm moving. Like I'm going like 10 minute miles. It's nice because it's, it's downhill and you can, you can actually pick up some speed without like feeling like you're you're being hard on your knees and legs exactly. because it's gradual enough. Yeah. So I start like doing like I probably did like a full ten minute mile and I'm like, why have I not caught these guys? They were only like a few two minutes <laughs> ahead of me, you know. So sure enough, I come around the corner, finally see them, and they're running. And I'm like, these guys are running like they're crazy. Like they got to do this again. You know what I mean? And and. Anyway, so I catch up and kind of working behind them, and I'm like, "All right." Then they were running maybe like, like 13 minute miles or something. Um, so they weren't they weren't running, running. It was more of a shuffle, and so I run with them for a minute. And I'm like, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go up ahead, and I just kind of want to like push for a couple miles, and and like this is like again kind of thinking like, man, if I can get some some good faster miles on on tired legs and stuff, this is just a good chance." And so I go up in front, and I put down some like heater laps. Like I was running like, you know, nine, 10 minute miles there. Um, but then there's some climbs. So you'd always have to like stop and climb up and then you'd run again and, and, um, just felt super good. And I get all the way down into the box Canyon and I'm like, all right, I'm, I need to slow down and fuel up, you know, cause I'd been drinking a little bit and eating a little bit. And I was, um, I'll talk maybe a little about this in a minute, but like I was eating and then I got into the box can. I'm like, all right, I'm going to slow down a little bit more even and really put the food down because I know I've got another 5,000 foot climb, climb coming yeah. in. So, but I didn't slow down a lot. Like I was still doing 13, 14 minute miles, um, probably through there. And so I'm almost to Phantom Ranch, like that last little bridge. Mm-hmm. And literally it starts to get real tight in there too. Like the turns get a little tighter. And, and I thought I was two plus miles ahead of that group because I had just gone that fast. And there was at least one spot where I looked back and like, I couldn't see him and, and I could see, I felt like at least a mile. And anyway, so I'm crossing that bridge and all of a sudden feet right behind me. Doo, 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 doo. Hey, <laughs> you know what? I'm like, just got to jump and turn around and sure enough, there's these three guys, Dan, um, <laughs> Anthony and, and Nick. And, um, I'm like surprised, like just so shocked. And I'm like, dang, you guys are like really pushing. Um, and I think it was Nick who was just like, freaking Dan is just making us run so fast. <laughs> He's like throwing down on the bus like, I didn't want to run that fast. We didn't want to run that fast. <laughs> just but go. they can't not. They can't not, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so and at this point, like we're almost a phantom. And, and in my head, I'm going, well, I hope you weren't running too fast to like hydrate and eat a little bit, you know, cause that's like your regen time. And, um, but man, they were, they were, he was so happy. He was so happy like that he caught up and, uh, but it was just so funny to see the guy in first being like so happy and the guy in second being like freaking Dan making a sprint down these hills. And like, <laughs> it was, it was comical. Right. But I, I was actually really happy because part of the, the reason we were going to do this was to hike with people and, and network and, and just get to know these guys. And, um, so I'm like, sweet, I get to hike out with you guys now, you know? And 
So we go down to Phantom Ranch. Um, and, um, of course you get there and there's, there's a bunch of other people there that are camping and we're like, you know, very quickly sorting through our gear, get filling up water and all these, like everyone around us is just kind of like looking at us. And finally someone asks like, what are you guys doing? We're like, oh yeah, we did rim to rim to rim. And they're like, no way you guys did rim to rim to rim. And then one of them was like, oh yeah, we're going to do it again tomorrow. Right. And they're like, what? Like, who are you people? And they're like, <laughs> we're Navy SEALs. <laughs> like he says to them. <laughs> they're like, oh yeah, that makes it like, it was just so funny. Like they're just toying with them. Um, <laughs> but, um, so yeah, I'm trying to think if there's really anything else at Phantom. Um, I, I don't think so, but yeah, basically got into Phantom, was feeling, feeling good. I, I had, you know, really focused on getting some food down. But again, just a pretty – oh, before Phantom in, that, in the Box Canyon, I ran into three sheep. Oh, you did? Three sheep, yeah. Um, so I sat there and filmed them. And, they, I mean, they just had dropped down like a steeper section and climbed up another steep section next to it. It was like one of the only parts that wasn't just cliffs, cliffs. So they came all the way to the bottom? All the way to the bottom. That's yeah. cool. It one of the guys that so I cool. kind of passed up because he was having feety, feet issues, he, he said he saw sheep as well and filmed yeah. it. Yeah, they saw some coming down South Kaibab. It was actually, and that one was a ram. And it got stuck between two groups mm. where it went to jump off this way and then it hit into these guys and turned around and came right past them mm. on the trail. That's cool. And he got like a slow mo shot of it like jumping across the trail. That's sweet, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, it was a, it was a good video. Um, but yeah, I was stoked. I'm like, I was really enjoying the whole thing. Like I was, the, the run down to Manzanita had cooled off. It got it just hot enough where I'm like, man, should I put some, some sunscreen on my face? But, it was just kind of like at that level, but real peaceful, nice run down to Manzanita, get into the canyon. It's cool. I'm, I turned on some music and was just, just enjoying it. Ran into these sheep, which was really cool. And, um, yeah, I'm just a, just an enjoyable, got to Phantom Ranch and, and it was like, all right, this is like hot. Like if you'd been here all day, it would have felt hot. Um, I think, but, um, yeah, just a, a good, clean, clean run for me to at least. So did you. Point. Did you fill up water like at actually at Phantom Ranch yeah, or down by the store. river? Pump? At the general store there. Oh, okay. well, that was kind of the funny point is I'm literally there filling up stuff, and one of the guys with us went to go like try to buy a, a beer or a lemonade or any see what they had in the store, yeah. and I guess he got behind some people that were I don't know what they were doing, but he was clearly unhappy <laughs> oh. about it, <laughs> yeah. and because uh, he's like he was trying to buy it, they couldn't anyway. So I'm like sitting there fueling up, and I just assumed that they were all getting water there. So we go to leave, we leave, we get all the way down to the river where there's that other water stop. And they're all like, hey, do you guys need to grab water? And I'm like, it's like half a mile. What do you guys mean? Like, yeah. oh, you got water? I'm like, what were you guys doing at Phantom Ranch? Like, huh. I don't understand. I thought we were all getting water there, but I just wasn't watching what they were all doing, I guess. And I don't know what they were doing, but um, so yeah, they stopped. They stopped there to get a little more water, they but got, I had already, I, I filled up both ways at the general store there at Phantom Ranch. But. Oh, okay. But yeah, um, so yeah, how was your hike down and and back down to all the way down to Phantom Ranch? Um, it was, it was. I mean, I was glad to get off the top for sure because it was. I felt like it would just it just kept getting colder and colder, um, and to a point because you get low enough that it starts getting warmer. But yeah, it was it was fine. The, the seems like the clouds kind of were breaking up a little bit more, so there's some more sun. It was just really pretty, like those. That change of being cloudy into the sun was really nice, and um, yeah, I just kept kind of a my moderate pace um, till that was when starting down the north rim was when I started having to to relieve myself like at least twice an hour. And it was I don't know if it's like going downhill or if it was the cold, but. That was like the start of it for me where I was I was stopping so much to go to the bathroom. Um, You're also not the fastest pit stopper I've ever met. Just just throwing that no, out there. No, no. I'm like, I'm a, I could be like done and out of there like 10 seconds. No, <laughs> mine are probably a minute stop for sure. Maybe more. I don't know. But yeah, they're not fast pit stops. So it, it, make, it bothers me when I have to go that much. Mm-hmm. So I went down, stopped, had to stop several times just – from there to Manzanita, but then when I got to Manzanita, the sun, it was nice. There was it was not raining or anything, so I'm like, okay, well I'll try taping my foot again. So got some more snacks, um, 
And that is kind of where I decided to eat like some more, like a more substantial. So I got like, I, my, my main lunch meal on these hikes is usually like a tortilla with salami and cheese and mustard. Um, so I got that out and ate it. Um, you know, ate some more substantial foods and then just re- repackaged all my stuff to be accessible. But then I, yeah, then I had to take my one shoe and sock off, retape, and it was, it was, it was, it was dry. So it wasn't, wasn't a problem. Um, yeah, use the bathroom. I did stretch a little bit, just haven't gone down that. I just stretched the legs, took a few minutes to do that, and then um, hit the trail. There were, at that point, I think there were, there was, I don't remember who, there were some guys behind me, um, but they, I thought for sure they'd catch up, but they didn't. So I just hit the you're trail again. Like, you're not talking about like the camera guy, like Justin and that group? I never saw, I didn't see them okay. I was at gonna all. Say, um, I saw them coming down. and Yeah, I never and, saw them from the time way up on the south rim when we first broke away. But you had to have passed them on the way down from the north. No. Like I, I, I don't. I couldn't explain it. Like I don't know. I never saw them. <laughs> ah, except for going down the south rim. Okay. Um, Weird. But uh, yeah, left left Manzanita, and uh, I think kind of like you. That's a that was a very enjoyable hike. S- um, such a recharge. <laughs> where it's like you get a lot of recovery just by hiking at the same pace. I mean, even like faster pace but on that stretch it's like seven eight miles of really good trail that's the nice thing about that stretch is it's like consistent trail and you can get in a rhythm and it is like recovery while you're going and so that was i really enjoyed that but yeah from like north rim down to probably that tight stretch of canyon um i was like totally by myself um and then Great weather. Um, was feeling feeling good. Um, just continued to have to stop and 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 go to the bathroom. You know, how every... are you doing? Like, <clears throat> you think you were overhydrated, or maybe you didn't have enough salt to retain it, or what are your any thoughts on that? I don't know. I mean, it's hard to. It's like I don't know if actually overhydrating actually causes that. You know what I mean? I mean, I I would assume it does. Um, I was I was consuming two liters of water between every water stop. So from Manzanita to the north and back to Manzanita, I consumed four liters of water over fourteen miles. That's a lot. So, I mean, it. it I, I'm sure that's probably most of it. I felt like I had, yeah. in terms of how I felt. I felt great in terms of like sodium and, and electrolytes. So I think I my intake was fine. But yeah, it was I bet. it just became just so inconvenient and annoying to stop so many times. Um but I felt good, you know what I mean? Yeah. I eventually right when the canyon got tight again, um I can't remember his name. Um but he was I, I caught up to him. And he looked like he was walking like pretty slow. So I was just like, "Hey man, how you doing?" He's like, the "Oh, zipper man. zipper pan guy, Brian, I think his name." Is that his name? No, it was Brian. the guy that finished the hike last year. Um, mm. I, I forget his name because um, there were two that said they had finished the hike last year. He was one of them. So I was like, "Hmm, how you doing?" You know, I asked him how he was feeling. Anyway, he's like, "Oh yeah, I've got my feet are torn up. I've got big old blisters and." He, he had said he was unhappy with his shoes. And so I, I hiked with him for a little while. So I just, I'm like, well, getting down towards the bottom, haven't hiked with anybody for several hours now. So hiked with him until he had, he's like, I, I got to stop and get off my feet for a minute. So I pressed on and uh, just got down to um, the, the water spigot on the right by the river. Mm-hmm. So I, I didn't stop in Phantom Ranch proper. Yeah. I just went through and then just stopped at that last water spot right by the river. Um, and, uh, yeah, filled up water. And that was where I mixed in my the, the super fuel yeah. powder. 
Um, just that's so a, I that's had a high carb drink mix. You get about 400 calories in a, in your drink mix. Yeah, yeah. So I had, I think I had three extra scoops in that rationed little Ziploc bag. So it was probably like more like 450 or 475 mm. calories. Yeah. Um, but I was kind of staging to have really faster burning calories, you know, accessible. Yep. Um, and, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what that was probably, it was almost dark. I don't know. I don't know. It was right around sunset, I'd say. Yeah. Um, but yeah, filled right up water. Right as it started to get freaking cold. Yes, it was crazy how fast the temperature started dropping. Mm-hmm. And I was I was still just wearing an altitude hoodie. <laughs> and uh, But I wanted to be in that as long as possible for the uphill stretch. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, that guy wasn't far behind me. He, he, he caught up to me right about the time I was putting my pack back on to hit the trail. Mm. And then, uh, yeah. Started the uphill stretch, crossed the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess for me, just to phantom ranching out to kind of cap off some of this. Um, um, yeah, I, there's essentially at that point there was three other guys in me um, that started up. And I had I had very and – I'll, and I'll cover this a little bit here in a little bit. But I had definitely s- slowed down, fueled up, knew this climb was coming. And um, so I was, I was hoping – it's kind of one of those where, like, you get to the hill and you're like, I hope I feel good. Got to the hill, started up it, and was like, I don't feel great, but um, I feel like I can hold a very steady pace and feel good about it, right? So, like, there's, you're starting to slow down a little bit compared to, say, the North Rim climb. And um, I was feeling good. We started up there. We got about a mile into that. And um, and Dan, you know, I think I think from what I understand, he hit, he hit a calorie wall, right? He So he, he, like, dang near stopped. Like, he had to, like, slow down that like like really significantly and and get some food and stuff in him and so he dropped back um so then it was nick and anthony and me just cruising out and it was um it got brutal it got brutal our goal is to like my kind of goal like we kind of had a time goal that these guys have been kicking around and then and then it was like all right like we're slowing down pretty significantly about halfway up the climb it's like let's just see if we can get out in daylight like if we can get to the top and and not have to put our headlamps on. Like that was kind of the new goal. And so, yeah, just kind of kept pushing, clicking them off. But man, we hit this sign halfway up and you don't think it's halfway up. You think like, oh, we got to be like, you know, 70% plus the way up this thing. And you get to this sign and it says 3.5 miles to the, to the South Rim. And you're like 3.5 miles. So then I do the dumb thing and I pull my phone out to check elevation. Like how much more climbing do we have? Right. <laughs> And it's like 2,500 feet. And you're like, we are literally halfway. How can we possibly be only halfway? You know, so I definitely had to like kind of get to into my mental state of like, like it didn't, it didn't like slow me down or stop me, but it was one of those where it's like, that sucks. That I wish I didn't know that. Right. Like, um, cause it definitely after that, I feel like the two guys with me mentally also kind of wanted to slow down. Mm-hmm. Eventually Anthony kind of, he stopped and put some more layers on. I mean, dude, that guy can wear a lot of layers, but um, he yeah. stopped, you know, kind of put some layers on. He's like, yeah, go ahead. And so we we kind of, we pulled out a little bit from him, but um, it was, that that's like where the real last, that was like the, the only part of the trail that honestly felt like a real grind was like the last mile of the North Rim and this like three and a half miles on the South Rim. Um, but the thing that kind of was just got a little frustrating is we were still getting beautiful views but then not long after we passed that sign, this wind just rolled in. And I mean, there's one point when we're, you're kind of on more of like a, a convergence of, of the, the ridge. Um, and so you can see off one side, see off the other. And we were on this thing and it was just like blasting us. And like, all right, this is not as fun anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I had the Nebo on. I wish I had gloves on, but I just didn't want to stop and, and use the gloves. Because I also had these trekking poles that have like grips. And it's, it's a battle to get gloves on and then put those grips back on. Um, I love those poles, but but gloves with them are just a little annoying. And so um, I didn't really want to stop. And so then you're just, you're just hoofing it out. And, I mean, we passed a couple groups that did not look like they were in good situations. But, you know, they're just pushing on. Like, what else do you do? Like, so many people drop into this canyon and just going down, it's so much easier than when you turn to go out. And so they get themselves into – 
situation. So one of the guys we passed was about at that halfway sign to, uh, to, um, Asian guys that on the older side of life and they just did not look like they were, I don't know, but I, we passed them. And then like another group passed them later on, I found out two plus hours later. And I was like, they passed them three hours later and they'd only covered two miles still. Yeah. Like they were down to a crawl. I remember hearing that and they were, they were tourists. Like mm-hmm. they, it was you or the other guys tried to talk to them. They didn't speak any English. You know what I mean? So they, they definitely did not know what they were <laughs> getting into. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's, that canyon's brutal, but, but yeah, we, we pushed on, got to the South Rim, me and Nick, um, which this was Nick's first hike with these guys as well. And, um, a kid, a kid's tough. Like he's never really done distance like that, but he was a, a former college, uh, running back and he was just an athlete, you know, and he, he, um, <clears throat> he pushed on hard and, and did it pretty dang well. But, um, yeah, we got to the top, snapped a photo and then that was it. Like, it was like, where's the headlamps. And it, and at that point it was so cold. It started snowing right then, like maybe started snowing with like less than a quarter mile for us from the top. So we ran over to the bathrooms, you know, shut the doors essentially to stop the wind and then, and then layered up. And then we got all layered up and about the time we were about to leave, Anthony showed up. So then, um, we ended up just waiting for him to, to hike back to camp. But it was like the whole hike back to camp, like the three miles across the top, the flat, we're just in this deep conversation of like, this is bad. Like this, this is potentially sketchy because. I don't know what these other guys have packed. I don't know what kind of layers they have. I don't know how far back they are. Cause like at the speed that we were moving and the speed that we were passing some of these people, it was like, these guys are going to be a long time. Right. And then if you're down in the Canyon and it's that windy and that cold for that long, it can become a real risk, especially if you've got to stop or someone gets injured or anything. And so the whole back hike back to camp, we're like, you start to think like this could be real bad for people and that was definitely like the talk of the conversation for the rest of the night was like, man, I hope people have decent gear with them. I hope that they're still moving. And, um, yeah, but we got back, climbed like immediately into our tents, like had to literally shake snow off of our tents, climbed into our tents, got warmed up. And I'd kind of jokingly said like, we should go get some food, but I wasn't sure if they wanted to or not. And then sure enough, uh, Tyler Boschman shows up and he's like, Hey, we're going to get pizza. So like we rush out, we like basically smooth talk our way into a seat before they close the restaurant. And, uh, yeah, we had some nice hot pizza and we're just thinking about everyone else who's still in the Canyon. Did he roll in with Mark and Steve at that point? He rolled in with Dan. Oh, he was with Dan. Okay. So he caught up to Dan and then him and Dan hiked out together. And then Mark and Steve, we had left and I think they must've showed up pretty quick after we left to go get food. Mm. Um, I don't think they were much behind us, but yeah, so we went eight. Um, it was awesome. I mean, for me, dude, it was an amazing day. It was like smooth sailing, no injuries, not really feeling too sore. Like my strategy, which I can kind of get into in a minute, like it was was just smooth. Felt, felt it was like it was like a redemption trip on the canyon because the first time the canyon beat the tar out of me. I got injured, messed up my knee for months. Um, it was just a battle, and so this one was like. For me, at least it was good. But then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking there's some people hurting right now in that Canyon. You know, you're just thinking about that. So we get back to camp and then, and then Steve, who's kind of like the, the organizer of, of this group, you know, he's like started asking a bunch of questions and then he, um, essentially he's like, all right, I'm going to go and like wait at the trailhead. So they don't have to do the last three miles in this freezing cold snow. And that was kind of it. Um, I can't remember if. If I went to sleep before you got back or if you like, or if I, I think I was just in my tent and you showed up, I was about to go to sleep. You showed up, you know, asked, ask how your trip went and just sounded like you were just hitting your marks to, to go back. And, and you're like, all right, I'm going to try to get a few hours of sleep and then go back for round two. And I'm like, bring them. Uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone's doing round two, yeah. <laughs> but it, I'm jumping ahead in your story here, but. Well, it's fine. I mean, cause well, so. Yeah, so I step off from the bottom, and like I said, it was the end of the day, you know, getting sunset-ish time, and so start climbing, and um, yeah, my my 
my goal was kind of like with the north room was to just keep a steady pace up the north uh, or up the south, south rim. And, uh, you know, because, again, like I came down here to do it twice. Um, and it's probably, I mean, it's relevant to climbing up the south rim. Is like my strategy, like we, we were actually, when we stepped out of camp in the morning and we were kind of walking along that, along the top for those three miles, mm-hmm. kind of mentioned to a couple other guys, like my kind of timeline is how I was trying to strategize it or game plan. It was like, if I can do the first round in 18 to 20 hours, like that, then that would tell me I was like doing my, I was keeping my pace, like in that window, how I want it to be yeah. just in terms of energy management. Um, so that's kind of how I was strategizing my pace up the South Rim. Um, and I was feeling quite good. And, um, I, I, I'll, I should say I went down and did this hike by myself four weeks prior. Um, and so throughout this whole hike, I was kind of like mile for mile comparing where I was at and how I was feeling compared to four weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, there were some, there were a couple conditions or one major condition that was different this trip versus the earlier trip, um, which was the, the timing of my sleep. Um, but I was like mile for mile feeling so much better than the time I did it before. Um, so when I, you know, I wanted to be really careful and just for context. So on the previous trip, four weeks earlier, when I started up the South rim, um, towards the end of the hike, like I hit a wall that I would say was a sleep deprivation wall and a calorie wall. I hadn't managed my calories very well and I had been, awake for a very long time. And those two combined to like reduce me to rubble for like three miles. And so I was comparing how I felt and I felt really, really good. Like in terms of, I felt strong, but yeah, my feet were really hurting, but like, you know, as terms of physical ability, like I was feeling great. So I just maintained that pace. Um, you know, that there's kind of like, I would call it a break area. There's like a little hut it's an open hut that's yeah, got yeah, like yeah. the benches inside. Yep. It's not fully enclosed, but it does have a roof. When I got to that, um, oh, you were still I a was, long ways from the top. <laughs> I was feeling like feeling really good. My feet were killing me, um, but I. That's where you hit your your sleep wall last time. I hit it before that. Even before that, basically, oh, yeah. a quarter mile up the bridge, past oh. the bridge. Yeah, that to would there make for a very long climb out is where I hit the hitting. wall, but. Mm. When I hit it, when I got to that place at this point, I was feeling really good. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to, I want to get off my feet for five minutes. So I set a timer and that's when I put my Nebo windbreaker on because the wind started, like you were saying, you know, brutal. it was really it was blowing, blowing dirt into your eyes. Like it, it was, was just like, it was brutal. It was. And so I thought, well, I'll get in here. I'm going to just lay down and elevate, elevate my feet for five minutes. Um, I didn't even like stop and eat or anything. I was doing really well on calories. So I did that and then figured I would check my one heel again. Tape had shifted a little bit. So I just kind of like slapped another thing of tape over the top of it. Mm. And that actually was a pretty quick stop, um, maybe 10 minutes. Um, And it was totally dark at that point. But from then on was when the the wind was just blowing snow it wasn't a ton of snow at that point on the trail, um, but, oh, I don't know, maybe a m- couple miles later was when it really got bad. Now, that sign, that sign that you passed. Everyone saw that sign. Well, what's interesting just... for me is, like, for me, that sign is a more positive experience mm. because that trip prior when I was, like, just really – in in that wall zone, yeah. Um, that sign is when I started coming out of the wall because I had stopped and drank a bunch of calories and and pounded a bunch of like high like uh, sugary foods. Mm-hmm. And so mentally, for me, seeing that wall was like a it was like okay, this is like the downhill stretch. Even though it's <laughs> it's very much uphill, but like oh, man, mentally for brutal. me, it was like there's that sign. I remember last time 
starting to feel better when I was around the, this area. And it's like a those switchbacks. I was just going to say, I'm like, it's surprising you're feeling better right there because that is the absolute steepest part of it. It is. Those switchbacks so are steep. like, in my opinion, the most physical obstacle of the whole South Rim. Yep. And that sign is not even at the end of the switchbacks. It's like three-fourths of the way up those switchbacks. You still have more. But I do remember, you know, like for me, it was like, okay, there's the sign. And it's not like I was uh, like – happy about it, but it was a, it was like a positive motivation for me. Um, and which was good cause I needed some positivity because then from there, the rest was like the weather. It was just like, want to get into high exposure spots. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to just stay with just the Nebo on again, because it was, it's physical. Um, but I also, you know, that was when I really started thinking about the, the effects of the weather, you know, and potentially what they would be on me. But at that point it was dark that every once in a while I would check behind me, you know, you can see the the line of headlamps behind you, mm. you know, all the way down the trail to the bottom. Dang. So then I was kind of doing the thing where I was like thinking about other people of like, okay, they're down there and um, the weather's getting bad. So that means they're going to be in this weather longer than me. And I knew what I had, and so I was quite confident in managing the weather or the conditions. But, yeah, I'd say from from there, um, I had it really well um, in my mind. I've got, like, milestone checkpoints from there all the way to the top. So it's for me, it's just kind of a, okay, I've just – the next checkpoint is this place and then this place, and then it's the top. And so – but, man, it was like one – probably one, one and a half more miles where there's a lot of exposed ridges and the wind. Then at that point, like a mile later, so now I'm maybe two and a half, two miles from the top. The It was like the weather just stopped like even holding back and it was full snow and it was like hard icy snow and it was blowing horizontally. It down at you. And I, you're hiking by headlamp and so like – the 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 light from the headlamp reflects off all the snow and it's really hard to see and the wind was physically moving me a lot of the time and so i was like very conscious of like those are very dangerous conditions for like a quick onset of hypothermia if you're like if you're not dressed right or if you're not dressed right and you have to stop and so like you know i was just quickly calculating all this in my head. And I was like, man, I'm starting to get very bothered by the wind blowing, like stinging my face with the snow. And so I just like, I just like doubled my speed. I am, I just really started stepping it out because my thought was like, one, it's going to warm me up Two, It's going to make it less time that I'm in these conditions. And three, I'm tired of this dang snow hitting me in the face. And uh, so I was just like, I want to get out of this. I treated it like it was like a, you know, just a something I just wanted to get over with. So I just picked up my pace for like the last two miles and um, two miles to the rim. And like, yeah, by the time I got to the top, the ground, you know, the ground's covered with snow, quite dangerous conditions. And I kept looking and the lights – you know, we're just getting farther and farther away, like the headlamps of people behind me. And so uh, there were a couple guys up ahead of me that I was kind of getting like just right up about to. Um, and by the time I got to the top of the uh, south rim, um, I could just see him like 100 or 200 yards ahead of me. Um, but it was – it was freezing cold. Like it was really, really cold. And and the wind just was not slowing down. The snow was not slowing down. And uh, once I got to the top, I did stop and put on a fleece layer and then put the windbreaker back over top of it, put both hoods on, and then just had that three mile, three mile hike back to camp, which was interesting because I kind of just followed the group when we – went from camp down to the canyon but uh so i wasn't really familiar with the route i was like kind of going off memory and footprints so i was just f trying to follow the footprints of the guys in front of me and uh 
but I was also trying to go as fast as possible. And uh, I think I was probably going at about a like four mile per hour pace, but, uh, and I was just following footprints, following footprints. And cause if I would like look up, um, there was just so much snow blowing. I couldn't really see, Yeah, it was but my lights could actually see the footprints. And so I was just following that. And there was a couple times where I, I started seeing the footprints and then I registered, wait a second, these footprints are going back towards me now. So I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess I better turn around. So I would just turn around and follow the footprints. And then you could tell that they were like, they had gone past a turn or something. And then I, and then I'd get behind them. And then I, I think I'd see kind of like the reflection of headlamps way up ahead. And there was like two or three of those instances, but yeah, I, I definitely tried to kind of book it um, back to camp once I got, got to the top. But uh, yeah, those, I mean, those guys in Hedy had said like they thought you were running at one point because you increased your speed so much at the top. I, it, I mean, it would have looked like it too, especially because like when you're trying to go fast, you do have to almost like start jumping up on some and of those logs like if you're gonna horse. if you're actually gonna pick up your speed. So yeah, it was it was interesting, and yeah, I got into camp, and I, and I actually you know physically like I was feeling quite quite good. Um, and again, especially comparing to how I felt the last time when I got to the top, I was like pretty dang tired, but you know, I was feeling like I could pick up pace and, and push it out a little bit faster, but, um, but, uh, yeah, that was interesting. And so, yeah, you were, you were in your tent. Um, and those two guys were the only people that I saw when I got to camp talked to them real quick and then went over and kind of talked to you through the tent. And that was kind of when you were like, I don't think anybody's yeah. going tomorrow. Cause like the consensus, like when we got up there was, <clears throat> it was brutal. It was hard, but the temperature dropped so fast and so much, and there was so much snow coming down. And I think after you've done a 49 mile day, it's not the time when you want to reassess if you're going to do finish something, right? Like yeah. you're, you're so far and you're so tired and you're, and you're getting sleep deprived. You're tired. So like the, the snow is like the way that the guy that was hiking with me, he's like, this is the icing on the cake. Yep. This is what's, you know, and essentially, cause then you're thinking like, well, that trail could be slick. Like it doesn't only, it, like on the North rim, even it was like, you, you take a few steps on it, it hardens up, refreezes, and now it's ice. Right. And so yeah. that was, I think the, the number one thing that people kind of cited is like, ah, the trail is going to be too sketchy to go back down with, with really fresh snow like this. And see, everyone kind of had said, no, I think we're not. And then because I had seen Steve like get in the van and go over there, I was like, that's not what someone would do if they were like planning on going back out to do another 50 miles. They'd go straight in their tent and go to sleep, get calories, yeah. go to sleep. So I'm like, my like consensus is like, I don't think people are going out. The group I was with weren't acting like it. Steve came in, wasn't acting like it. So when you got there, I was like, Brigham, just just so you know, like before you go dive yeah. off in the canyon when no one else does, I, I could, don't think they're going. Yeah, it was it was really weird. Um, just an interesting because I did most of that hike by myself. You know what I mean? So like I get to camp by myself, and so like I had no idea who was where. You know what I mean? Like yep. I had no idea what conversations had gone on ahead of me, um, and so, but I wasn't about to go like knocking on tents and ask waking people up. I yep. just assumed people were kind of sleeping. There were those two guys that were just ahead of me. Oh, I talked to I you. I tell you this. Dan, his plan, because, you know, he's, he was like kind of leading the charge. He wasn't going to sleep at all. He He's was going to turn and burn on the south rim. And, and I, like, I kind of like just kept asking him. I'm like, are you serious? Like, that's insane, man. He's like, yeah, I just think like if I stop too long, I'll get swollen. I'll get this. So like, mm. so, like I don't want to get all stiffened up. And I was like, dude, that is bad a like to just yeah, turn yeah. and and burn on the south rim um that was his original plan you know i was like that's interesting yeah i so i so at that point you know you said that everybody else was basically asleep well i mean to my knowledge right like mm -hmm. i didn't even know mark and steve had taken the van like yeah. i didn't even know they weren't in camp um so i i was just like well i'm gonna get in my tent eat some dinner, um, refit and set my alarm for three hours from now. I, that was kind of what I wanted to do was get three, three and a half hours of sleep and then, and then get up. And 
I just assumed that that was kind of what was going to be happening is that people would just be getting up at their their times and that doing probably hikes, probably hikes. when I get up, there's probably going to be somebody else and a couple other guys doing the same thing. And so, um, I don't know, I, we can kind of maybe we can yeah, kind of about, transition back to you and kind of what's going on at this point. Oh yeah, or, I mean, I was, like I said, I wasn't ever planning on doing it the second time. And so, um, I'm just hanging out. I don't have a rush to get into sleep or anything. So I was kind of listening in. I'd heard, did like kind of bump into Steve here a little bit there, but then yeah, I mean, I talked to you, went to bed, and and just assumed no one was going back out. And then, sure enough, um, about 3 a.m., Steve came walking over to a group of tents that was right by ours and was like, hey, do you think you could get up and go sit at the trailhead? I can't stay awake any longer, but these guys are non-responsive. Um, like, I'm messaging them on the Garmin. I'm messaging them on the phone. They've always been responsive in the past. Like, usually we're sending messages back and forth, and I'm getting no messages back. And so um, – I'm worried, but I can't stay awake any longer, right? Yeah. And um, so as he's having this conversation at 3 a.m., the guys finally get to the top and call Steve on the phone. And so, like, as he's having someone else getting ready to go get in the van to go sit at the trailhead, yeah. he gets a call and is like, oh, they're at the trailhead. I'll go pick them up. And that was the last group of guys. There's three that guys was. in that group. Okay. That was – so – <clears throat> so yeah, so then I'm thinking like, I, I, and I might have said something to you, I don't remember, but I'm like, Brickham, no one's if if Steve has been awake for all these hours waiting and like and it's this whole situation, I'm like, dude, don't if if you're still thinking about going again, don't because no one's yeah. gonna go but you. That was yeah, it was. Um, it's interesting like piecing it all together because like I said, I I got in the tent, had some dinner, um, just kind of got myself ready to get some sleep and I set my alarm and I fell asleep. Like I would say probably pretty instantly. And, but I did, I did wake up and I remember hearing like, cause I had like a hood on, or mm-hmm. bumped, but I had, I had like a hood on and I was in my, in my quilt and leaning against a pillow. And, but I did, I did wake up and I guess I didn't, think it was my alarm, but I remember hearing Steve kind of moving around and like, I could hear some of these things. Um, but it was like, in my mind, it wasn't making sense because I remember kept looking back and seeing headlamps behind me. And so I was just like, am I like, you know, delirious or is this not making <laughs> sense? And, but I was like trying to pay attention because I was like, who would have been well, behind me? who was behind me? That was terrible weather. And like, so then I started like running through, well, if anybody stopped, man, like to rest, like you could get in a really bad situation. If you were just like so tired that you thought the right thing to do was stop and rest and you're totally exposed. Like there's no, there's no shelter. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I, you know, if they maybe had some gear with them, then maybe they'd be okay. But yeah, I was like trying to piece it together. Things weren't adding up, and I was like really tired. Um, oh yeah, because I do remember. I think I looked at my phone. I was like, my alarm hasn't gone off yet. Um, but then I, that all kind of like settled down. I didn't hear what actually you weren't that, like that somebody had enough to know what happened. That there. somebody called yeah. and said like, hey, they got there. I didn't really hear that. Um, so I, I, yeah, I went back to sleep. Um, and then I think when I did check my phone, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to reset my alarm for an hour. So in my mind, I'm thinking like, oh, well, if I just wake up in an hour, get up, if anybody is up and going, then I'll go with them. If they're not, I'll set it for another hour and then do the same thing. But I, and I remember thinking like, but at that point, it's going to be between like five and six if I get up a second time. And if nobody's up at that point, like there's no way anybody's doing it in that time frame. Because the time frame they had to leave on yeah. Sunday morning. So, and... yeah, I I went back to sleep <laughs> and then woke up to my alarm, kind of woke Dude, up, was... stuck my head out. Nobody was – there was yeah. not a light on. So I went back to sleep again, woke up around 5.30-ish, did the same thing, and it was totally dead. So then I – then I like – zonked till seven thirty, maybe eight o'clock or something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, just to wrap this, the story part of this up really quick, 
basically got up the next morning, snow all throughout camp. I was kind of shaking snow off my tent. There was a, there was a surprising lack of accumulation for how much snow I felt like I shook off my tent. But, the, you know, like there's maybe one or two inches max, you know, and, and yeah. we kind of hung out the next morning, talked, and then we kind of just, just broke down camp and, and headed our own ways by 10 o'clock or so. But awesome, awesome hike, but wanted to kind of go back really quick and just talk about a few key pieces, I feel like. So if you're interested in doing this hike, absolutely recommend it. Um, obviously physically, I think you understand now, like it's extremely demanding. Don't go in there like untrained. Don't go in there without a, a game plan and, and stuff. But so some of the things I wanted to touch on, I, I actually did the math just cause I think it's valuable to, to track this and share this. Um, <clears throat> I consumed from the time I woke up and then got back off trail, I consumed 6,600 calories. Um, I had brought much more than that. I'd brought about over 8,000. Um, I probably could have eaten a little bit more if, if like on the, the very end of the, the, the thing, but it got to the point where I was like, I'm so close to the end. My hands are so cold. I don't want to deal with it. And so I just kind of quit eating essentially like the last, but 6,600 calories. Um, so electrolyte wise, I drink, I don't know how much I, I got there, but I was aiming for some pretty high electrolyte numbers. And I try to drink a lot of my calories. I packed, um, about 2022 is either 22 or 2400 calories, um, of mix-ins mm. specifically. And I got off the trail. I bet I had consumed about 1800 or more calories in the liquid form. That's I really, good. really like those for climbing, just like you mentioned, because yeah. you don't have, you got your hands and your trekking poles at that point. You can't be like eating gummy bears efficiently and climbing. Right. And so I really tried to make sure that I was drinking my, the most amount of calories on the climbs. Mm -hmm. Um, food wise, I brought uh, the number one food for me was mangoes. I had those Costco mangoes. Oh my gosh. I ate bags and bags of those. Um, you know, I had some bars that went down pretty easy. I had some, I had like some knack purees that I like. Um, and then I had some like that's it bars, which is like a fruit blended up fruit bar, but it's like a hundred percent fruit. And then just some like fruit puree things, which is basically gummies. Those all went down really well. Um, and then when I would stop and I was resituating, I'd grab a handful of jerky mm -hmm. and I'd eat those at the actual stops. I didn't really want to eat them while I'm trying to run, but I'd, I'd grab those, eat them while I was there. And then I'd kind of walk out of the place with a, with a handful of jerky. And that was kind of like my protein trying to br make sure I was getting some protein in throughout the day. And I think that that helps as far as like you say, maybe slower burning, but also just you're breaking down muscles the whole day. So I think it's, it's good to be putting some of that in throughout the day. Um, but that was kind of like my food strategy as far as what I took. But I think the bigger thing was I, I was very cautious of how I wanted to, to ex execute this. I wanted to hike down the South Rim. Once I got to the bottom, I wanted to put my poles in my pack and free up my hands, give my arms a break from like stress and get them like so that they're fresh again when I get to the next climb, but also get my hands free so that I can eat and drink, right? So then I really liked that. So from like Phantom Ranch all the way up to Manzanita in both directions, my hands were free and I could consume a lot more calories. And the idea there is, is I was going through those sections, basically like juice up, like get, get like well over a thousand calories in my system. And so then when I hit the hike, I'm kind of refold up and, and then I don't have to eat as much while I'm actively hiking. That worked really well, both in terms of getting a lot of calories in during those sections. And also I did like having my hands free, it allowed me to film a little bit, allowed me to eat a little bit. And then my arms just, I don't know if it, like, it's a real thing, but like, they're just fresh. Like I, so like, yeah. so that was my, my strategy there really thought that strategy worked well. And probably the number one benefit of it, of putting my poles away was access to eating while I was going. I mean, I was, I mean, just mile after mile, I was just, you know, popping yogurt covered raisins in my mouth or, you know, just, just kind of just getting it down. And I think that worked really well because I did not hit any kind of walls on the climbs till maybe the south, the top of the south rim when I just kind of consciously quit eating and because I didn't, I just didn't want to anymore. <laughs> and yeah. I was like, we're so close and we were going to hit our timeline that we were like, we were hitting, we were on pace for what we wanted to do. So, yeah. um, so that was kind of my, my strategy with it. I, I was planning on doing some light, you know, faster movements through Manzanita to Phantom, that, that bottom part, whether that was jogging or whether I was, you know, hiking really fast, I wasn't sure, but I did plan ahead of time to move quickly through those areas. And then, 
you know, not try to like run or, or do anything too crazy on the actual rims um, themselves coming down or up. Um, but yeah, mangoes were the, were the ticket, man. I ate a lot of mangoes. Um, I've never eaten. I'd, we don't have a Costco here where we're at. Our, our city's too small. And so I think that's my new thing though, is anytime I, I'm down there, I'm buying a bag or two of those. Cause those are my, like, they're heavier. They're not like the lightest calorie per ounce, but they just went down so well. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, I, I certainly appreciate the bag you gave me. <laughs> I, I enjoyed every one of them because they, they're, I don't know, there's. There's sugar it's, on them. It's important to like recognize and test out and prove out for yourself like what you consume easily. And like mangoes, yeah, for me too, they something about the 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 chewing, the sugariness, um, the consistency, how easy they are. Like you eat one, it makes you want to eat another. So mm-hmm. it's like um with the like the really long distance high mileage when you when you actually are really trying for maximum efficiency, like um, how easy your food is to consume is like a big factor in your efficiency and in, in accomplishing like the the, the, the plan you want to execute, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, when you want to eat it, it makes a huge difference. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of sums up those sides of things, some of that strategy. Now, some other things that that we specifically mean you did on this hike, and I think is very wise um, when it comes to like emergency gear, like we always have like first aid kits and things like that. But we specifically also brought um, some prototype down pants and a you know down jacket of some kind, right? A puffy jacket. And the reason behind that, and I also brought gloves and some really lightweight rain mitts, so I had some pretty good warmth on my hands if I needed to add those two layers. Both of them are really light, but they do, in the combo, they do really well. Um, And the idea here is we knew from previous experience, like let's just say something happened and you had to stop and you're on the north rim. Like it's so cold, you're likely covered in moisture from sweat um, that your body temperature can start dropping so fast. It becomes, becomes a very den- dangerous, or like you said, pre hypothermic or actual hypothermic situation so fast. And people don't think about it enough. So we had these, like, what we just called our down suits. Mm-hmm. I mean, and it was like between the two pieces, it's, it's maybe a pound, right. Of, of safety gear, but man, there's a lot of peace of mind that comes with that. Because again, when we got to the top, when I got finished with the hike and I was thinking back, I'm like, those guys in the back, like, what if they have to stop? What if, and they don't have a down suit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, man, that is so, um, it's so much safer to have some gear like that. And so maybe you don't have specific gear like that, like puffy pants, but I mean, at least bring like thermals and a rain layer so that you can layer a few pieces on and try to retain some of that warmth. Because yeah. when you got 40 mile an hour winds and you're kind of wet and cold, and, and let's just say something happens. You even hit a calorie wall and you have to start moving too slow and you start to not generate as much body heat. And it's a downward scary spiral. Yeah. I, I mean, I kind of my strategy or my reasoning between behind taking that down suit, like was a lot of it was based on the hike four weeks earlier where, you know, I did that by myself and I hit a calorie wall, a sleep wall. And I thought, you know, if I had need, if I had actually tried to stop and get some sleep on that trip, I would say at best it would have been pretty hard because it was not nearly as cold, but I also, um, well, actually on that one, I did have the down suit, but, but, if I needed to sleep, I could have slept mm. because I could have kept all my my body heat, right? Like I could have curled up on a bench, um, put my down suit on with my windbreaker underneath to 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 block all the wind, and actually got you know say twenty thirty minutes of sleep and recovered, and then finished the hike. And so going into to this hike, that was a big part of it. Was well, I'm trying to do this twice. And I know that at some point sleep deprivation could come in. So I want the ability to stop and sleep without threatening my safety and actually be able to get some sleep. But then also when we looked at the forecast, it was like a no-brainer. I'm absolutely going to bring this, the, the, the puffy suit because, um, again, like let's say I do run out of energy and I need to lay down and take a quick nap or, uh, you know, I 
you know, maybe we need to help somebody else or wait for a group to catch up to make sure that they're on the right route in that mm-hmm. weather. You know, you are so sweaty with that wind, like it'll suck the heat out in five minutes. Like in five minutes, um, if you were to stop and just sit there with no, you know, no other layers and you're wet, like you could start getting hypothermic in probably five minutes with those, with those winds and, and the snow. So that was, that was like a big part of the strategy and like just what seemed like just mandatory safety, safety. equipment. And, and that was, you know, that was heavy on the mind that night was yeah. like those guys behind me, like if they're, if they're exhausted, um, if they're going so slow that they're not even generating body heat, then, you know, that, that could be a bad situation. So yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'd say my, my pacing strategy, I felt was pretty much spot on. Like I'd finished in about, it was about 19 hours. So I was kind of right in between the 18 to 20 hours. And I felt like I had a lot of good energy. I think I probably left 500 calories unconsumed. I probably consumed about 4,500 that day. Um, but I felt, I felt good, you know? Um, and, uh, yeah, it was, it was good. So last couple things I wanted to hit on, cause man, I just, just looking at this, I got a, I got some meat and we've been on this way, way long and this has been awesome. I love retelling this story and reliving it. Um, cause it was just such an epic day and adventure, but, um, two other pieces of gear I wanted to point out personally, uh, number one in gingy socks, um, I've got to push and try to get these inside the membership. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, we have a, the live ultralight membership, 10 bucks a month goes $10 into your store credit. Um, and then you get discounts on everything we sell, including retail items, but these in Jinchi socks, um, I went through the whole hike, zero blisters, zero issues whatsoever, but I was consistently bump. You know, other guys were taking off shoes, messing with stuff, talking about it. The interesting thing was I was not the only one on the hike with in Jinchi socks, but every single guy with Njinji socks told the other guys the exact same thing. I've like never had a blister with Njinji socks. They work so well for me. Like I don't even need to bring two pairs of socks now and so on and so forth. If you're doing big efforts like these in particular, like I still like darn tough for certain things, but when, when, especially when you are not too afraid of being cold, um, cause I, I like by, by, by doing the toe socks and, sp- and spreading your toes out, you get, it, like it adds a cooling effect to your feet mm-hmm. and that's part of where like the blisters, you know, come from. But so I would just say, don't necessarily wear them in cold temperatures. Cause I did that once and they're freaking cold, freaking cold. Yeah, totally but for cold. this, um, phenomenal. And, and there was multiple other guys in the group that had the same, you know, experience with me. Um, you know, especially again, like on the, fr- like maybe not for you or it was on the heel, but like on the front of the foot, phenomenal toes, you know, and all the, and all that area, it just keeps the heat down and, and friction down. So those are a huge win. And then, um, just the skyline pack for an effort like this, that thing was absolutely amazing, right? I'm packing water and food up in the front vest area of those pockets underneath the bottom. I can store more things for me. I'm running my camera and my phone down there, but you could easily put gloves or I put my windbreaker down there at one point or my bag of mangoes down there. Like food it has a lot of access, but for a long day out like this doing 49 miles, um, you know, I also need to carry a little bit more than like a little tiny day pack, you know, cause I do have like a little down suit in there. I'm carrying a lot of calories. There's a little bit of first aid stuff you want. Um, and so that pack capacity wise and, and like for the effort itself, um, just absolutely worked phenomenal for me, was really, really happy with it. And, and for guys looking at doing efforts like this, I think it's definitely one to look at. Yeah. You can go with a smaller pack for sure. Uh, you could, you know, get like a 15 liter, or maybe even smaller, but you are like maxing that back pack out and, um, and I don't know. I, I really like this one for that because I don't have to max it out. I can always shrink this down more and more, um, but it's like built to handle it well. So like it doesn't start bouncing, right? A lot of these like that are basically running vests and then you like put 15 liters of gear in them. They get a tremendous amount of bounce, which then creates friction and blisters on your back or on your sides. So because this one is designed for heavier loads, just never had any issues um, with with you know, that, that never had any blisters or, or rashes or things like that. Um, so that was a home run. 
<clears throat> but um, yeah, those were just some of the, we talked about the Nebo. The Nebo was freaking awesome. Use the Skyline trail shorts. They were awesome. I went with a long sleeve altitude because I'm, I've been really conscious lately about like overheating myself. And so I'm trying to play with some different gear. Cause I've just been such a hoodie guy for so long, I'm trying to play with some different gear to help with that. Um, the long sleeve worked really well. I will say that on the North rim, I was using the Nebo hoodie to, to help block that. And that was kind of the idea there, but man, the Nebo hoodie was like 10 times as loud mm-hmm. <laughs> as an altitude hoodie would have been because yeah. the wind was just like just flapping that so yeah. loud. And I had to have the hood on so that my hat didn't blow away because I had my hat like as tight as it would go. It was just a whole a whole thing. But the Nebo was awesome. And, uh, you know, everything really worked out for me. Had, had the Hoka's, no blister issues. Hoka's worked great. Never even took my shoes off the whole day. Um, So, yeah, that's kind of gear breakdown for me. I don't know if any, any last words because I mean, I'm – couple minutes to wrap this up yeah i'd say the Injinji socks are good i used them on my last one mm. no issues whatsoever was using different shoes yeah. i don't think there's any pair of socks that could have done anything to prevent the issues that i had heels are um, different yeah heels are just different but but they absolutely work well for the toes and they work well for everything my last rim to rim to rim um the uh on the packs um whether or not you have a skyline or not i was using a cs40 um, but just making sure you have the ability to cram a ton of accessible f- uh, food and fuel and drink mix that you can just do stuff on the go um, is it's a you, huge you had part the two of upper pockets. Yeah, I, I added two shoulder strap pockets, and then I have my hip belt pockets and my water bottle pockets on the CS40. So I, I was able to load up a lot of stuff really accessible. That's key just in a, a, a high mileage trip like this where it's like you're beyond the normal mileage that you're going to be able to, you know, have an end of day recovery. You're like end of day and then a whole other day on top of that. But you need all of that nonstop. So, um, yeah, that that was big. I do, you know, for me, having a kit that's got some Luco tape or other tape to take care of feet because I had a feet issue – um, you know, that was obviously a, a major factor for me. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of my big gear takeaways. I, I use joggers, um, the whole time I me packed too. a pair me of too. skyline shorts in my pack in case the weather was favorable, but I did the whole thing in the joggers and, and honestly, they were like perfect for me because of the weather conditions. They were, they were perfect. Yeah, I might have said that I did them in shorts, but that was that was inaccurate. I did the the entire hike in, in the Skyline joggers that are going to be coming out in early summer. Um, and same thing, they vent extremely well, but they block the wind, so they work like a, like a, you know what I mean? So like on that north rim, I'm not getting just smashed by the wind and having it rip away all my heat. They're venting, but they just have that edge. And so um, perfect. Cho- I loved them for this. I never never felt like I was overheating in them. But I was sure glad to have them on both of the the climbs out when the winds whip in and, and stuff. So mm-hmm. uh, if you're someone who, I mean, they're just a really cool tool to have in the tool shed, right? Like, well, some people like hate the idea of like hiking and getting stuff brushing against their legs and stuff. So like that works for them. But like, it's like you're hiking in a pair of pajamas or I run in these a lot. So here it gets freaking cold in the winter and you're running. And on mornings that it was windy, I would literally run in these. And I, I mean, I'm running... 10 plus miles in these. And it feels like they're shorts. Like I would forget that I wasn't wearing shorts essentially. Like that's how well the fit, the work is for me. So, um, yeah, look forward to these. They're, they're a sweet tool to have for barely a couple more ounces than the shorts weigh, and the shorts weigh four and a half ounces. Right. So like you're talking fraction of the weight of pants, um, but just massive utility in these things. So really excited to get those out. And they were, they were money for this trip. I was, yeah. a lot of the guys do one guy hiked, uh, <laughs> jury, he hiked in his underwear for like 10 miles. Oh, he did. Yeah. He had pants and he's like, pants are too hot. So he just ripped them off dude, to just hiking in his underwear for miles. And, um, you know, so that's like an, a good example of just like, I was never too hot. He was in these pants with vents and they were way too hot for him, mm-hmm. even with the vents. So, yeah. Um, really, really cool product. I'm really excited to bring it out and there's definitely an awesome use case for it. So, all right, that was our recap of our rim to rim to rim adventure. Um, an adventure it sure was. And, but what a, what a hike highly advise you guys have this hike on your, 
your bucket list. Now you don't have to do R3 in one push. Um, there's different ways you could do it. You could just do rim to rim. You could do, you know, north to south and stay in a hotel, come back to the north. Um, so you break it up over two days. There's options here. So don't feel like you have to do it this way. But getting into the Grand Canyon, it's amazing. Don't just see the Grand Canyon from the top of the rim. There's so much more to that canyon as you drop down into it. You can camp down in there. There's multiple camping site areas, Cottonwood and 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 uh, Phantom Ranch and other ones. So go spend some time in the Grand Canyon. Highly, highly advise it. Awesome, awesome trip. Hopefully this was valuable in terms of a good story, but also in terms of a few key takeaways for you to take if you ever go and do a, a trip like this. So thank you, Brigham, for coming on, spending a couple of hours with us. Maybe our new longest record. I don't know, but... Um, but it was awesome. So, okay. With that, if you guys would please share this podcast around anyone that you want to, uh, hike this trip with you someday, I think that'd be awesome. Um, and just make sure if you have not yet rate and review the podcast, um, as always go join the level trail membership. It's a phenomenal way to save on backpacking food, other essentials, as well as save on all of our gear. And it doesn't cost you anything. You just load $10 to store credit every month. So it's a phenomenal offer. Thousands and thousands of people join, have joined this and, and they stay on it because it's it's such a win-win scenario and we're adding more and more to it all the time. So go check it out, um, just at OutdoorVitals.com. Make sure you guys are subscribed and we'll catch you on a future episode of the Live Ultralight Podcast.